Welcome back once again to Kevin Pollack's chat show. How are you? Where the hell have you been? I am, as always, chat show. Sammy, Jamie, working things out. That's an interesting thing to happen. I don't know what got on my foot. It's <laughs> gone now. Did you think it was live and living? What? I didn't know what. I thought it was Velcro. Oh. <laughs> um, we've come to you uh, smack dab in uh, pretty much the middle of May here. Um, those of you catching us not so live. Yeah. If you want to join us live, I dare you. I dog, double dog dare you. Just go to the YouTube, check the calendar to see which show you might want to see. Upcoming guests, eh. For example, you got your, uh, your Rob Delaney, the hilarious, the warped mind, and now Twitter god, Rob yeah. Delaney. Hilarious actor Jason Mantzoukas. Uh, the always delightful Bonnie Hunt. Uh, Michael C. Hall. Dexter fans out there. And so much more. And Six Feet Under as well. And Six Feet Under. Let's not forget. You see the connection between Six Feet Under and Dexter, don't you, in principle? A little bit. Yeah. Are you saying Just Dexter's, a little bit? Are you saying Dexter's premium, gay? Both premium death? cable channels? Death. <laughs> oh, there's death. Death. Oh, I was going for both premium, premium. and cable. Yeah. Oh. You're right also. <laughs> I wish we had prizes. Um, Where's my $20? And internet sensation filmmaker Freddie W. Freddie W. Uh, I can't wait to actually talk to him. I did a thing for him. He has like a, a, at least one million views on every new video that he puts out. Sanity. More than that. He's a, he's a real sensation on That's YouTube. That's Lynn Sanity. It is Lynn Sanity. And uh, he's more Asian than... Oh, is he? Is he's he a like, basketball player. Like Charlie Chan Asian? Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. All right. <laughs> uh, but we did a thing where he, he has a real hypnotist friend who hypnotized one of their other friends. And we acted out this thing where he took his friend on a little mission. And I played Christopher Walken in one section and Jason Statham in another section. And the guy was under and totally was freaking out. And it was fantastic. And then everyone who saw it said, well, yeah, that was fake, right? He wasn't really hypnotized. And if, he's, and if that's the deal, if he's not hypnotized, it's the lamest thing you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. It's only interesting if, in fact, you believe the truth, which was he was under and didn't know he wasn't talking. You couldn't have convinced him that I wasn't Christopher Walken. I'm still not convinced. Yeah. And I'm not hypnotized. <laughs> um, Sammy, I understand your Cubs are doing a little better. Well, they're doing all right. Yeah. They, they haven't lost like eight in a row or anything. They're so doing that's better a than horrible. Yeah, Which anything is, better than last place horrible is uh, makes you oh so happy. I think they're still in last place, but they're they're climbing out. Yeah, yeah. And Jamie, the podcast, your uh, Mad Men My podcast. Mad I know called... we're having some audio issues. We have to check that equipment. Mm. Apparently, no one can hear me. They can hear Lon because Lon talks like this, but no one can hear me. You are you close? I am one? close, and I'm speaking at a and I, we had a really good episode last week. I feel like it was one of our stronger ones, and apparently, no one can hear. Well, I'm going to say... You know what I suspect? I suspect there's this other podcast coming out called Winging It, and they borrowed the equipment. I'm just saying. They broke it? I'm, I'm just saying. Are you they were the just last ones, saying? They were the last ones Because I touch sense it. you're saying more than just saying. Is that a podcast where they discuss where to get the best wings in any given city? Um, kind of. That's like one of the premises. Because it should be. It is. If it isn't. <laughs> it is. They, they, eat, they uh, eat chicken wings and, and discuss current events, I believe. Oh, yeah. well, no. That's only half of one of them. It should just be strictly chicken wings. I'm not sure, Maybe though. Maybe celery. I'm sure, like, Corey's in the other room being like, you're, doing, you're, giving, you're not giving it justice. You're, doing, you're saying it all wrong. Yeah, even though there's a likelihood that that's exactly what he's saying, you're still <laughs> the type that would think that anyways. <laughs> uh, and here you see, folks, why we've celebrated four years of doing this show quite recently, our fourth anniversary. Thanks to all of you for your cards and letters, and by that I mean emails. Um, did I mention today's show, uh, the fine folks at Ting is bringing you our, our sponsor. We want to thank them for their involvement. If you want to get involved, write to us at contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. You know we love to hear from you. We had a Larry King game winner last week. Write in your Larry King game. Hell, video it. Send it in to contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. Go to the site. Have some fun. Spend some time there. Don't forget the merch store, you son of a bitch. Are you on your way to Amazon.com? I am. Are you? Stop by our site first. There's a banner you click through there you'll get right to the home page and we'll make two cents and if uh, 17 million of you do it uh are you enjoying us on the airwolf we're so very happy to be a part of the uh, number one comedy podcast network known as airwolf um 
that are dropping the show every other Thursday. We're in talks to go going back to being weekly. I was lazy at first, thinking that I could take more Sundays off if we were every other week. But now we had Eli Roth here. Yep. We had to wait. The show drops on Thursday, but we had him before he was on Kimmel, on Fallon, and all these other shows. Yeah. They aired same day. Now we're scooped, skunked. Well, and I'm a little cranky about it. Do you sense it? I a little, but <laughs> that's why our fans need to tune in live. Yeah. See, I tried to encourage the live thing, and I'm getting a general go fuck yourself. I mean, what the hell are they doing on a Sunday afternoon? <laughs> That's better than this. What are you, the Lord? Yeah. Are you mm -hmm. resting? No, that's Sunday that? mornings. <laughs> right. I don't want to hear it. Um, so, uh, Jamie, is it, is it Mad Men episode seven tonight? Uh, no, eight. Eight. Mm. I know. Fuck. Not many left. It's it's already disturbing. Are you enjoying the Mad Men? Write to us about that, you son of a bitch. Contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. I think I've overstayed my welcome on the opening. Never. Kill him outside, by the way. Kill him. Every week. Uh, we're thinking about taking a show on the road. What do you think? Uh, tell us why your town should be the next town we select. Uh, we th there's talks of our first show being here in Los Angeles live in front of an audience. Um, possibly in a couple of weeks. We'll let you know uh, as early as uh, our next show, June 2nd, with Rob Delaney. But um, we're interested in taking a show live in theaters around the country. We've done it at Sketchfest. We did it at uh, S uh, South by Southwest. Um, and the time has come to, to, uh, to, to go large. Go large. I've got uh, several filmmakers lined up. Mm. You're Jason Reitman, you're Barry Sonnenfeld, you're Eli Roth, you're Judd Apatow, who I saw at the recent uh, Star Trek premiere. Um, That's a different, fran a different franchise. Right. <laughs> it's a different Star Trek altogether. <laughs> Even your pal Quentin Tarantino said, I love the idea. Call my agent. That's right. <laughs> So that'll be interesting to see if we get him. But yeah, so we're going to go out on the road with this thing. Uh, tell us why we should come to your city. Write to us a contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. I mentioned four years as an anniversary. My guest today and his cohorts, I think, started the podcast revolution. They certainly are in the Guinness Book of World Records, some 280 million downloads later. Um, I was working on a film... No, the Lost Room miniseries for the fine folks at the Sci-Fi Network. Wrong finger. And uh, uh, because I was away from home, it was the perfect companion. And I, I got the first season of the, uh, um, I guess it was called the Ricky Gervais Show, the first podcast. We'll find out for sure. But um, I dialed in immediately, and then it became that thing. You remember the Robert Evans audio book? Oh, the kid stays oh, in the Lord. picture. Oh, come on. Everyone just Epic. passing it around. Have you heard this? Like turning yeah. people on to the greatest drug on the planet. And it was such a great joy to, uh, to turn people on to. Uh, all these years later, so many other accomplishments, um, some worthy. <laughs> and we'll discuss those and the others. Please welcome Stephen Merchant to this very table. Uh, you know, it's a... It's a it's rare that I uh, introduce a guest by, A, trying to embarrass them and then myself <laughs> by saying what a uh, obnoxiously devoted fan I am. I, 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 I've prided myself these 171 interviews not doing that. But something bizarre happened for me, someone who'd been a fan of comedy albums, uh, comedy radio, Fireside Theater, um, which would be American version of so many wonderful things. Um, uh, Cooking more? No. What was the uh, Dudley Moore and Peter? Right. Cook? Yeah. Cooking more. Yeah. 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 Um, and then from your research, I saw the uh, Fry and Laurie was right. a big, big influence. Yeah. But there was something about the alchemy uh, of the three of you mm -hmm. that um, was instantly clear was 100% uh, unrehearsed, unplanned for. So my first question was sort of, at what point are you aware that the power that is the Pilkington mm. has gone from stooge to invaluable? Uh, was well, there ever a moment where you guys had, a, you and Ricky actually had a conversation saying, you know, if he walks, we're fucked. 
<laughs> I, well, I don't think we thought we were fucked. I know you all, didn't. All, all, and, that's <laughs> a health, and that's a healthy ego, by the way. Yeah. And, and, and clearly, you were masterful before you invited him in. Right. But at some point, he became... We've done some other things such, that people <laughs> enjoy. But he had become such a part of the fabric. Right. And, if I may uh, tip the scale even further, such a part of the joy for the two of you. Right. So it was no longer what you had started out doing and had succeeded wildly at. It was suddenly, you had this wonderful puppy, mm. this, this retarded toy that was just... Well, I think we, I remember very early on, uh, he said something, he, it may have been when he said something like, in conversation, we were doing a radio show before we made the podcasts, and I think he said something like, what are those things in the film Gremlins called? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And I remember thinking, oh, th hang on a minute, this is, there's some, some gold dust here. And then he told a lengthy story in which, at, in, me in passing, he mentioned, anyway, I, was, I went around to their house and they had, you know, they had a horse in the house. And anyway, and, and we went, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and he was going to move on from the horse in the house, because that was just a bit of detail as far as he was concerned. Right. And we went, no, 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 let's go back to the people with the horse in the house. This is where the interesting thing is. And that was when I think we realized this is a never ending well, because he didn't seem to identify uh, what everyone else was going to find interesting in his anecdotes and in his observations. You yeah. know what I mean? He thought he was, he was going down one road, and of course we were all enjoying it sort of on a parallel road. Right. And, and that's that impossible, because as a comedian, you know, your job is to try and seek out that alternative road to sort of find the comic angle on things and but unfortunately you know most comics are fairly smart people most of the good ones and so there's always that slight sense that you know you're pretending to be stupid or you're pretending to take a sort of comic perspective on something right and he just he was just saying it as it is yeah and it was obviously wrong yeah well he was a rare breed that it was instantly clear this was not a gag he was the right. real thing there was no explaining you needn't um, even bother explaining to anyone. Mm -hmm. you, anyone who listened would know within a nanosecond yeah. that he was 100% real. And there's no other way to get that magic unless it's that, I right. don't think. Those characters have been written, they've been performed, right. but not to that level of instant and joy. And he was furious because there were almost immediately conspiracy theories that he was a character, sure. an actor. Right. I forget. What the, there was a particular accusation. They even seemed to have identified a name for him. Did they get him up with an actual they came name? Up with a name for yeah. him. What was his name? Keith Pilkington. Keith, something like that. And um, and uh, that made him furious. Right. And it made us, us angry because we used to keep saying, you know, do you think if we could write a character this good, we'd have squandered it on a tin bot radio station and then a, a half baked podcast? This would be we'd be putting this on TV and you know and making a fortune from yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I know that um, that uh, he's been asked by everyone, and you've been asked by everyone. So I'm I tried desperately to come at it with, with an original angle and realize it wasn't possible. But when you start doing the um, um, I don't know what the hell's the name him on the road the um, idiot thank you idiot abroad. Um, are there moments we don't see where he has the wherewithal to actually refuse to do something? Because he kind of refuses to do everything. Right. And then one of you or both of you gets on the phone and, and shows him the light of day. Mm -hmm. Is there another phone call we don't see where someone reminds him this is actually a job? <laughs> I mean, it's well, not, none of our damn business, but there's, what the there's a lot. There's a lot of things. Uh, that you that we've cut from that show where he's being relatively normal. Sure, sure. Who wants um, that? And who's who cares? Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you know he is. I mean, I think one of the things about Carl is he will stumble a, across elements of profundity sometimes. You know what I mean? That uh, no one's noticed that. Don't worry, that's fine. <laughs> Honestly, that's. I tried so slightly yeah. to get in there, and yet. No one has seen it. Don't worry, Kevin. Just keep going. Just keep going. Don't worry. Um, there, uh, you should keep talking. I think. My oh, I'm sorry. Problem. Okay, your problem. Your, yes. Yeah. Um, so, yes. Uh, yes. He, he. 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 Sometimes he will hit upon ideas. Um, I remember he, he. We. We sent him to Jerusalem, and he. There was something quite sort of you know that idea of kind of from the mouths of 
infants or whatever. Like, there was something about him being genuinely distressed by the wall and the division between these two cultures. Right. That he kind of approached with a sort of like an almost childlike naivety. Like it, it, it was ugly to him. It was brutal and ugly, you know, that wall. Sure. And there was something weirdly moving about that, you know, because right. he, 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 he's not aware of the sort of political history. He's not really aware of the kind of the or, ins and outs of it. You or know. anything. Or indeed anything. So, but just to sort of see it, just to react to things on a very human level like that is actually quite sort of, is actually quite sort of wonderful. sweet in a way, you it's know. Wonderful. And I've never quite seen a travel program like it because most people who go on do travel programs are informed. You know what I mean? You don't send an idiot. Not most all. Yeah, they, they're generally people that should be doing it, that yeah. have some some sense of, of, of the world. And, and it was weird, the sort of the occasions where he would hit upon that. So that was the stuff we were seeking out. And, and really the things where, you know, he was refusing to, to eat a cow's testicle or whatever, you know, was, that was just, that was, that was the fun. That, that was what brought people in. Sure. You know, and it was the testicles that brought people in, and it was the observations on the yeah. Israeli-Palestine the conflict wind, that kept stay them there. for the testicles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was certain, that was another thing. Am I uh, back and running? Uh, give me a little something on the screen that tells me uh, I'm being heard without uh, scratches and creaks. Um, I guess uh, you're fine. Yeah, they're not typing anything. Wait, they're typing now. Still tweaking. That's bad. Um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> what an operation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's wildly impressive. Yeah. That's why you test the mics before you go live mm -hmm. and then they say everything's fine. Um, uh, uh, one of the, okay, well, first of all, let me ask you this. I like to jump around a bit. A few years ago, you wrote a piece for The Guardian about a vacation in Vietnam and Cambodia talking mm -hmm. about uh, uh, a less than idiot abroad. Mm. Um, among other hilarious insights into your fear of most things, you shared how you carried wet wipes in a hidden money belt. Sure, yes. I'm going to need just a little bit more, as is Sam. Yes. Well, I, 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 I remember um, my father and mother were always fairly kind of scared of, of um, <laughs> otherness. <laughs> for want of a better word. All things other. Right, I mean, even going to sort of France, you know, which is not far from, mm -hmm. from England. <laughs> but even then it was, you know, are we gonna be able to get, um, are we gonna be able to get kind of milk? And or tea back. bags? Back. Are we gonna be able to get back? <laughs> um, so I've always had that slight fear of, you know, someone's out to get me. <laughs> um, and uh, so yes, I, my first experience of the bunny belt was in Cuba, I went to Cuba. And there's a sort of a sort of flesh-coloured money belt that you wear tight to the belly. You're telling us to a Jew, so stop explaining. Um, and uh, and there was a period when I first moved to London, and my father again very you know, careful in London because he's full of you know ne'er do wells. Um, and he he alarmed me so much that I began, I carried uh, a wallet, and then I carried a fake wallet. Sure. Because my theory was if I get mugged, I give them the fake wallet. But then I got paranoid because I thought, well, what if they open the fake wallet there and then? They'll say there's no money in it. They'll go, where's the real wallet? And maybe they'll cut me just to teach me a lesson. No, so then they I should, by the way. <laughs> right. So then I started carrying um, uh, just a few pounds and, and like a few kind of old sort of, you know, blockbuster cards in there. Good choice, by the way. Clever. Yeah. Uh, which I could afford to lose. But then I remember there, I was so paranoid because I brought this up with my father on the phone and he said, well, what if you give them the fake passport, the fake wallet, they realize it's a fake wallet, you need a second fake wallet. <laughs> so then there was a period I first moved to London for about six months where I was carrying three wallets <laughs> at all times <laughs> in, under the eventuality that, that someone would ask for my wallet. And, um, and sadly, I was never, it was never put to the test. Sadly. Sadly. But so consequently, going to somewhere like Vietnam, where, uh, you know, you're concerned not only with the threat of, of being, not so much mugged, probably conned, fleeced by a kind of savvy Loss of local, kidney. Right. That I, that I carried not only the money belt, but also the, um, the, the, the sort of wet wipes just for hygiene reasons. Right. Um, Maybe pack an extra kidney. <laughs> <laughs> an extra kidney. You need, well, you need at least two extra kidneys because if they, you know, you give them one and then they, they want another. I wish I was your mugger. I'd be like, three wallets? I hit the gold mm. line. Yeah, right. This guy is each so one, loaded, he needs three wallets each to carry Each of the his fake money. ones still also having a few pounds in it. Right, exactly. You really do he's, make out. He's, and then, of course, you can't just put a few. You've got to put, like, you know, you've got to put a decent amount in the fake wallets, otherwise they... Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so you've done this a few times, though. You've you've written sort of essays about your uh, travel. Yeah, it's funny actually, I'd, I'd sort of forgotten the correlation really between that and, um, and uh, 
Carl's adventures. Yeah. Uh, the the one you mentioned about the Vietnam, that was simply because someone said, we'll pay for you to go to Vietnam sure. and Cambodia, all expenses paid if you'll write an article about it. Right. Bing bong. Yeah. That was what I got into show business for. Very yeah. early on, I realized Ricky started appearing on TV and would get sent free shit. And I was furious because I never got sent free anything. So my so almost my sole objective to be on TV was to get free stuff <laughs> sent to me. And occasionally they do. Right. Um, but cons- I'm obviously not considered a tastemaker. So you know what I mean? So I don't get sent the Rolex watches and the nice suits. Uh, you will leave here with a gift bag full of goodies, <laughs> by you. the way. Um, can anyone hear me, by the way? Should I, should I ask again? Write, write something on the board so I know I can stop asking at least. Um, a lot of people didn't know about you, as some don't about me, that you started out in stand-up comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, you were ob- uh, obsessed, um, or so it says in your dossier, with comedy from a very young age. I'm assuming that is the aforementioned Fry and Laurie. And, right. Uh, but um, Monty Python. Monty Python. Um, John Cleese, John Cleese in, particular. in particular was yeah. a hero of yours. Right. But also like a lot of American stuff, uh, Lauren Hardy in particular, uh, really? Bob Hope. The movies of Bob Hope I, I, was, I was and remain a big fan of. Yeah, um, the Marsh Brothers, obviously. Yeah. Um, so when when Woody Allen says that he's clearly taking from Bob Hope a little aside, mm-hmm. <laughs> everyone on the by the way, uh, just so you know, everyone in the chat room says they can hear me fine. There's a slight clicking. There's a slight clicking. A slight this is bullshit. There's a slight clicking. Yeah. The the Levine household says they can hear you just fine. Yeah. And that's impressive. I that's thought the clicking, the clicking normally is me typing, but I mute myself. So I did forget to mute for like 20 seconds. No, and of the, course, these trolls were like, I hear clicking. So I muted it. Ah, oh. we may, well, this is the fun part of the show for us, by the way. <laughs> I feel if people are getting this for free, they can't complain about clicking. <laughs> <laughs> it would be my argument. You know what I mean? Yeah. Agreed. If this was Letterman... And then we're clicking. Yes, we have people to answer to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though technically they're getting that for free. Right. right. I guess. But someone's paying up the wazoo. So, someone's paying somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Woody Allen said something like, when he first started performing, especially on film, mm. but also stand up, he was surprised when people didn't point out he was ripping off Bob Hope. Right. Those yeah. little asides. Mm-hmm. Are these the things you're realizing watching Bob Hope, or is it just the crazy amount of fun he's having? I mean, how much of the subtleties are? Well, the thing I the thing I always responded to was was kind of um, very distinct personas. Right. You know, like people often rave about Peter Sellers, and obviously Peter Sellers was a, a great talent, but no I, persona. But there was no persona. He was a kind of chameleon, and, yeah. and he was great for that. But there's a sort of there's something you're sort of. I always felt with Peter Sellers, I was slightly going, "Oh, well done, sir." Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. But I wasn't sort of responding to it in a kind of gut instinct way. And reason I always, you know, like Bob Hope or or Woody Allen, Jack Benny, um, Bill Murray now. Bill Murray is that the persona is so distinct that right. you kind of there's a there's a sort of excitement. There's a sense that they have a perspective on the universe. Right. And you know the idea of sort of Bob Hope and. When you think when he began in vaudeville and you sort of imagine that vaudeville was a much kind of, was a louder kind of Broad. environment and people sort of, you know, pulling funny faces. And in fact, I was reading a biography of him and he sort of started as a sort of comedian in blackface. You know what I mean? You can't quite imagine. And then to sort of somehow get his break in movies and to know that it had to be smaller and more subtle and there's a kind of easiness to his delivery and a kind of charm and, a, and something also quite urban. There's a sort of, you know what I mean? He feels quite, he feels of the city, you know what I mean? And as a kind of a man, Who's got a, like sexual desires and is sort of failing with women and there's a sort of there's a cowardice and I just, it just felt I, for cowardice, some reason, yeah. It just felt very contemporary, even when I was watching it forty years after the event, you know. Right. And that was the thing I responded to, just the, yeah, the, the sort of cowardice, the the eagerness to kind of seduce women and failing. And um, I remember there's a line in one film where he's being seduced by Dorothy Lamour or something for some information he's got, and uh, and she's trying to shoot, and she says something like. Um, uh, I feel like I feel like we've met before, and he goes, "Oh, I don't think about, I don't think so." And she says, "Perhaps in your dreams." And he says, "You won't want to be seen in those kind of places." <laughs> and I just love that idea of sort of, you know what I mean? That idea that even in that moment, there's a sort of honesty that you don't want to be in my dreams. That it's a creepy thing, but, and it's a sort of I, I don't know. There's something about that kind of that sort of honesty yeah. Tourette's yeah. that, that I Honest. think you know Woody Allen kind of had later and. Um, 
and you know Bill Murray and people, and, and it's just it's just that this, that very distinct persona was the thing that I responded to. Right. Yeah, and uh, I tried to manufacture in some way. Well, it, but but it's kind of become your thing. Right. Um, with Hello Ladies. Right. Right. I right. assume. Right. Yeah. So this is the sitcom I'm doing for HBO, and it's and it's really an expansion of all of that all of those elements, whether it be the guy wearing the money belt, which I'm thinking of it now could be a great part of the show. I mean, he, he's cheap, uh, my character, which is an extension of me. You know, sure. I don't think I am as cheap as I was when I was younger, but you know, I was always very kind of paranoid about money, about losing money, about getting value for money. Right. Again, partly because of my father, who was similar, you know. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and kind of, he's sort of, he, he wants to be a kind of ladies' man, uh, but doesn't really have the the chops right. for it and can't quite understand why he, why shouldn't he be able to date Charlize Theron? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's, he's a guy, she's a lady, she's got a kid now, single mother with a kid, she's gonna need a father for that. Why why can it not be him? You she's, know? she's tall. She's tall, exactly. So, you know, which is very much the same you're a, that's you're, exactly how I think about it. Should life. be a blessing. Yeah. At this you're point. Me. Why I'm not good enough for Charlie's what you're trying to say. Yeah. Um so uh, so there's that, that that aspect to it and um you know um and, and I think, you know, again, I, my hope is that people respond to it in the way that I did those, those personas, where there's something that people can relate to. And I mean, I remember listening to Woody Allen's stand-up tapes, and just I'd never heard anyone talk so honestly or so funnily about kind of just bad dating and, yeah. and, and, and just kind of weakness, you know what I mean, in every sense. Yeah, well, most men uh, share a common uh, fear. If it's all internal, right. uh, fine, uh, others can't help but show it right. uh, to comedic effect, I'm sure, for their dates. Um, you started touring in 2011 with a Hello Ladies sort of moniker. Right. To, so this had been going on for a while before it becomes the, now the show you're going to start working on. Right, but, but no, not with any kind of grand plan. It was just that I'd done stand-up, uh, as you mentioned, um, very when I first left university, right. uh, because I was such a fan of stand-up comedians, and I thought I sort of felt I ought to do it, you know, like a paying your dues uh, idea. And and I did it on and off for a while, and then the, the TV stuff happened and the radio stuff happened, and I just it was just easier not to do it. You yeah. know, it's just too much effort, and it's stressful, and it's long hours, and you drink too much, and you eat badly, and you're driving up and down motorways, you know, at two in the morning. And I just it was I wasn't enjoying it enough. I didn't need the thrill of the crowd. Particularly, that wasn't something that kind of excited me, and so I just stopped. And then, somewhere along the line, I just sort of I thought, oh, I, I felt kind of you know unfinished business with it, you know, and I wanted to go back and and see if I could do it well, and see if I could kind of um, uh, yeah, kind of exp I don't know, find something that I, that I could say that felt unique and personal to me, something which I missed actually doing a lot of TV, I, one of the things I always loved about the radio and the podcast was there's a sort of honesty to it. Right. And I think one of the reasons people responded to our podcast was that there, it felt like we were being honest and we were being conversational and that Completely. It, it wasn't sort of shtick, it was, there was a sort of truthfulness to Yeah, even though you had things like Monkey News, right. there, uh, uh, you know, which was so great. He never could really get to the story because he was three words in and you, right. were, you were on him. Yeah. It was just fantastic. But our responses were always honest. You know? Yes. And his take on it was always... It was what? always organic, right. every aspect of it. And I think that was one of the things that set the podcast world on fire. Right. I think that is actually the core. Right. But that's one of the great things about stand-up is I think, you know, and the reason someone like Louis C.K. is having that amazing moment is because people can see that there's a sort of honesty to his, yes. to his analysis of the world that is chiming with them and his take on technology or on, you know, the, the idea of, you know, we got the best we've ever been and everyone's still unhappy. There's something about that that's almost kind of, there's a kind of philosophy to it, there's a kind of modern pop philosophy to it that I think people are responding to. Yeah. And that, I think, is when stand-up can be at its best. And I wouldn't suggest for a moment that I've got to that point, but that was sort of the ambition, you know, was to try and Yeah, well, that. social commentary. I mean, Samuel Clemens was an early uh, touring um, monologist um, who, you know, was writing articles for the newspaper and then sort of got up on stage before he became a famous author. Uh, certainly once he became a famous author, it made these live engagements more more readily available. Yeah. But, but and then Will Rogers, I mean, we've had this history of social commentary as a form of stand-up comedy. Right. And then it, it, it's not the norm. It's never really been the norm, even though it seems to make the most... <laughs> right. Uh, resonating uh, um, impact. Yeah, yeah. Every now and then, a, a 
certainly Lenny Bruce, George Carlin, Pryor, they start talking about real, authentic right. things and getting away from gags and, yeah. and, and whatnot. Um, but the guys you were studying also didn't have that sort of authenticity. I mean, John Cleese was a brilliant performer right. that you didn't know anything about. Right, but I guess, you know, John Cleese is someone who, if he's known here, it's probably for Monty Python, but in the UK he's more well-known for Faulty Towers, sure. in which he plays a kind of infuriated uh, hotel manager. And there, although it's a, it's, a, it's a sitcom character, again, there's something very well observed there's something it, it, and it's the reason it's become a sort of a comic icon in England is that it captures a certain essence of the kind of frustrated little Englander the man who wants respect when he hasn't earned it and he wants he wants to be able to socialize with lords and ladies but he's not from that environment he wants to he wants to be invited to Downton Abbey and Downton Abbey don't know who he is and it angers him and what has he got to do for to get the respect he deserves and yeah. there's a sort of there's a there's a, a strand of kind of English yeah. sort of class fury that he tapped into there. So I think that aspect of, of, of that, I think, was the truth of, of him, if you like. Sure. And, and sort of this, this kind of barely contained rage. And while being in servitude at the right, same time. Right, while being in servitude, because he's got to par with these guests, all of whom he thinks he's superior to, right. even though they're paying his wages, you know. So, so again, I think, you know, even though it wasn't, he wasn't being truthful in the, in the Lenny Bruce sense, he'd, he tapped into something oh, very question. specific, uh, which was certainly something that we kind of later tried to do with some of our sitcom stuff. So, um, you know, so again, I think there's still a kind of undercurrent of right. reality there. I love the story that uh, when you first sort of meet Ricky, he's in charge of sp supervising of speech for... A radio station. Radio yeah. station. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to... to you're, you're meeting with him to be his assistant, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. And you find out you get the job because he calls you and says, well, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So right. if you're willing to do everything, right. you can have the job. Pretty much, yes. So <laughs> I've never heard of an association beginning that way. Yes, it's, very, it's weird, isn't it? Because there's, sort of, there's that feeling that it's easy to sort of romanticize these things and well, sort of, you know, what, what kismet that was. And... Well, not so much that, but the honesty on his part right. must have been an absolute revelation for you. <laughs> what potential employer says to an employee, I don't know what the fuck I'm right, doing, sure. so if you're willing to do everything, you're hired. I don't know that I've ever heard that. Right. Forget that a relationship was born, and we can move and romanticize the hell out of that, just as a, just as a jumping off point. Well, I think what's unique as well, though, about, about when we met is that Ricky had sort of had, it sort of had a life. You know, like most sort of people partnerships, whether it's in a band or comedians, they tend to meet young and they're they're on the road in their in their twenties and they're sure. they're busting a gut together sure. and they, they're kind of there's ambition and there's Larry drive. David, Jerry Seinfeld, right? And they, they met when they were kind of on the right. circuit. But but not only was Ricky older than me, but he you know he had he'd had a sort of short lived failed pop career. Yes, the, well, it the, was a one hit wonder kind right, of thing in the early eighties. Yeah. I don't think he was even one hit. I think it was just a one song wonder. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> and then he'd sort of, by his own admission, by his own admission, he had been for a long time a musician who worked in an office. Right. And at some point he became a man who works in an office who sometimes does music. Right. And by the time I'd met him, that kind of idea of sort of show business had really it been beaten since out of him. He just, it, and he just had this nice little life where he had this great uh, long-term girlfriend who's essentially his wife, and they had this place, and they, and he got this job on this radio station because he'd sort of helped them get on the air. Um, and, you know, but he wasn't thinking this is the, this is going to be a doorway to anything. to sort of anything. He was just like, this is, a, this is better than working in an office. I'm at a radio station. Yeah, this I'm in charge of something. As long as I can get out by five and go down the pub with my friends, I'm happy, you yeah. know? And, and so when I came along as this kind of eager 20-something, uh, kind of desperate to break into radio with that ambition, it was like, well, I can, you know, I'll make use of this idiot. <laughs> and, um, and I remember I set up a filing system sure. on day one uh -huh. for all of our paperwork. And I eventually left very quickly to join the BBC because I realized I'd probably get fired anyway. And I came back about a year later and nothing had gone into or come out of that filing system. <laughs> it was exactly as I'd left it. And, um, and I just, but I, you know, but, but at the same time, there was the thing that was exciting to me was that he had a kind of, he had a sort of juvenile excitement about things. You know, he had this kind of adolescent energy. Um, and particularly once we started going on the radio together, you know, that was when the kind of the electricity started because yeah. it started to make sense, you know what I mean? And you realized it, it was mad that he'd ever been in a kind of administrative role. Right. Why were they sticking him there? Yeah. Know? But I mean, could you tell 
that he was, uh, that, that the two of you had uh, sort of a, uh, or organic bent towards anything funny. You know, you, oh, yes. I, I think yes. we gather our friends in life um, through our sense of humor, more right. so than any other thing. I'm sure, I'm sure you're right, yeah. Um, uh, our mates, at some point, it's, it's all fun and, and sexy, and then you just have to really be able to make each other laugh at some Completely. point. Yeah. But I think it's so true about your friends, too, and why at some point, for most people, your family becomes just a fantastic um, separate entity that, mm -hmm. that you're, you know, it's, it's just clear the difference between born into right. versus a slow collecting of similar senses of humor. Yeah, yeah. Um, so whether or not it's, it's instant chemistry, just uh, are you making each other laugh? And, I think that was what it was, right? yeah, I think it was exactly that. Yeah. And, and I've never laughed harder than being in an office with Ricky through all the years we've been there. I've never laughed harder than, than occasions when he, you know, whether something will occur to him or, or he. And I think, I remember it was because what was interesting with Ricky is I think he, you know, like me to some degree, I think we used humour as a test. Mm. often to sort of to see if so exactly that to sort of seek out those friendships to sort of test people you encounter to see where they'll go to see what their parameters are mm. you know questions because often you know questions of taste actually are bringing up questions of sort of um, how, how secure are you in your own belief system you know right. what I mean that you're able to kind of play with with questions of taste and decency and so on you know what I mean yeah and um, and you know very quickly we realized there were sort of no boundaries in a way to what we could say to one another and that was very exciting. And um, but I remember he, he he there was a few friends he had that he would kind of play pranks on or he would play jokes on. And there one time that someone delivered to the office a, a balloon filled with breakfast cereal as some kind of promotional gimmick. And it was placed above my desk. And we were working one day, just you know, doing job a job of work. And he and I just heard the pop of the balloon and the breakfast cereal landed on my head and it just gently landed down all over me. And he was in hysterics, I mean, on the floor. Uh, and he's in his 40s at this point. <laughs> and, um, and, and, but I didn't, I, di I just went, well, you're gonna have to sweep that up. And I carried on working. <laughs> and, and he said that was the point in which he felt he could work with me because it was like, I, I wasn't bullied. I couldn't be bullied, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I just, I had a perspective on it yeah. that, was, that was almost adult. And, yeah. and that was the weird thing, it was even though he was older than me, I, I felt for a long time like I was the kind of sensible one. The parent. The parent, Without you know, question. and he was the kind of reckless child. But you made him laugh so very, very hard and, and often and easily. And that was uh, crystal clear in the early goes of the podcast. Um, and in fact, I want to ask about one very specific element at one point you were uh, writing for him and then you start doing the radio show and you make each other laugh but you're you're sort of spritzing ideas and bits mm -hmm. one of which it seems according to the audio record was introduced as a comedic premise by you and then later ended up in his act which would be Humpty Dumpty right I don't know if you I can't uh, remember yeah well it's been forever ago okay but in the transcripts or the audio recordings right it's just something you're spritzing right. why would he need the horses right. right you were the first to ask that oh, question okay. right so I remember thinking during the research well you at one point were sort of hired to write for him or, or write for the show no hired to write uh, well you mean on the, on the radio we were just high, we were just a, a, assistant we neither of us were there to be broadcasters really right. and then we just discovered that they they, they they just allowed us to do that but it was never re I was never really writing for him if any writing was done it was together. together yeah yeah it was never I was never sat in a room writing jokes or anything right for him so there was never a clause that said we're gonna do this show together and any material that may come from this show could in fact be now owned by me. I think it was. I mean, I think. I mean, I don't remember the, the 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 how that bubbled up. But I think. I mean, I. What's tricky is when you work in collaboration. We we worked together. Uh, you know, we've we started. I guess like kind of 1999. Yeah. And so when you work with someone that long and you spend that much time with them and doing multiple projects and you're doing a radio show once a week plus you're writing all week. Who the fuck? I think remember? you just don't. You know, it yeah. just it's just an endless kind of swell of nonsense. I, I had you know? this conversation actually with Dimitri last night as he, I, and one other person were standing having a conversation about something current. And the next thing you know, the three of us are sort of spritzing on why and how it's right. funny. And then the next you know, Dimitri's saying, well, now whose bit is this? Right, completely, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. How does it? Um, who, who, can own it? who can claim it, yeah. 
I just don't know if you ever had the conversation about the, why would you need the horses? I'll need to go back to those transcripts and maybe I'm owed some money. <laughs> I'm just saying, let me, let me help you help you. Um, the mobile disco, have you been ad, asked ad nauseum about a brief point in your life? Much. I mean, I know you've been asked about the six-month phase of wearing bow ties, so sure. we're not going there's there. No, there's no new information I can shed on that. <laughs> no, but I love the mobile disco at 16. Right. That's fantastic. Yes. Because we had someone else here, Paul Rudd, uh, not here from when we did a show in New York. Paul Rudd also uh, had a brief stint as a, as as a, DJ? a bar mitzvah DJ. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I remember, um, you know, I was never, this is going to come as a shock to people watching, I was never a cool uh, at school. And yet, when what, I think wait, back. You were never cool? Never cool at school, never considered cool. All right. And yet, when I look back, I think, oh, actually, I was doing far cooler stuff than anyone else. Like, you know, I was making money DJing. All right, yeah, it was weddings and it was bonuses, but at least I wasn't working, you know, I wasn't doing a newspaper round, nothing wrong with newspaper rounds, but you know what I mean? Like, as money goes, that was a little cooler. You were out and people were dancing, you were playing music, and it was a fun environment. And I remember, you know, when we'd drive around, and I remember thinking, you know, uh, it, this, was, this was great fun, and it seemed like a, quite a sexy way to sort of make money. Never never got laid doing no. it, never any action, ever. Don't think even a girl ever spoke to me when I did it. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I sort of continued that periodically throughout. And, and, you know, even now, occasionally I'll DJ at a friend's birthday party or a kind of, you know, or someone's having a house party. And there's a weird, there's a weird thrill about making people dance. Yeah, I, it's a really strange, weird, like, power thing, you know, and uh, very thrilling. I don't know. Tell me a little bit more about well, that. Well, I remember once I, um, because I understand the concept of, um, of forming story ideas, mm -hmm. and there's something about taking an audience as a stand-up comedian for a ride of your choosing, and right. you, you create the ebbs and flows, the highs and lows. And that's exactly what DJs do. Now, I would never suggest I've done it in the, I mean, if you see a great club DJ, that's exactly what they do for those partygoers. They will take them on a kind of journey. They will know how to kind of, to kind of give them a little rest period and then bring them back up, you know, and, and take them through that journey. Mm -hmm. And that's why those big name DJs are very successful. But even weirdly, even in a kind of small little sort of bar mitzvah wedding kind of version, um, you, you realize quite quickly there are certain songs that are joyous for people. Mm. There are certain songs which, which really, uh, you know, for that environment, for that particular time in history, for the sort of, you know, the, 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 the you, you discover that you've got kind of 18 year old kids, but you've also got like 80 year old grandmothers and sort of how do you tie all them all together? And then you realize, you know, you, you don't want to bring your ABBA in too soon because, you know, ABBA's a floor fitter. You can't, you know what I mean? Whereas people aren't going to dance in the first hour because they start, they're digesting food, they want to have a lot of conversation, then you've got to wait for the drink to kick in a Nobody little. Nobody wants to be the first out they there. They want to be the first to dance. So you've got, and then you discover, you know, you don't want to bring in Frankie Valley's Oh What a Night you know, and then not have anything to follow up with because you're up on the dance floor. But what do you follow up with? Are you going in straight away with Love Shack or you, when are you bring in Jacko? You know what I mean? Because once you bring in Jackson, you're set in a bar and it's, there's not much that can follow Jackson. Right. You see what I'm saying? I do. You know, so, and then it's like, which Prince tune are you going to play? You know, right. uh, it's tricky because um, some of the, some great tunes, like the Beatles, great band. There's not many songs you can dance now, to. Now, is there a chance that if a woman ever did get close enough to you during those days when they, you were saying they weren't even talking to you, and if you were to share the information with them that you then just shared with me, you would lesser your chances of... Um, I wouldn't have been able to have a conversation with him because I'd have been too focused. Right. Shut, wait, shut up. I'm just about to play George Michael. <laughs> shut, please. I, you know, when you're focused right. on the job of work, you've got to get it done, you know. And, um, and The other singer's name, by the way, in Wham, the not George Michael's name, of course, is... Andrew Ridgely. Of course. Who were you so happy with that they came up with Andrew Ridgely? Was it Forte. Will Forte last yeah. night? Because I share a birthday with Andrew Ridgely, the other guy. Yeah. Don't you think he's always been a very, he's been very dignified, I think, Andrew Ridgely. Sort of, no, in all seriousness, so it's not when he was in Wham, but subsequently, <laughs> but subsequently, you know, he's retired from the business, really. He's never, I've never seen him on a reality TV show. I never see him interviewed, kind of dishing the dirt on the days in Wham. He has just quietly gone away, done his thing, had a family and stuff. And you know what I mean? I always think, because when you see most, you know, former pop stars are kind of whoring themselves in one way or another, whether it's that show, is it Splash, where they're jumping into a swimming pool? I Which mean, I when think does that have, call come in? That may have started in, in the UK. That started in England, certainly, oh, I saw. Thank you for that. I mean, what? <laughs> have people seen this show? Have you seen this show? There's a swimming pool and yeah. people jump in the swimming pool, and this is TV. Yeah. yeah. But the, the, the timing which it takes to jump in the pool is that. <laughs>
but right. you've got an hour to film. So even with like 10 people, it's that, 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 that you know yeah. what I mean? So, I so was, how are you I filling mean, it up? I love it's supposed to be like a diving competition. Everyone's making a big deal of Louis Anderson just like falling. Yeah. Oh, it's, so, 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 it's, like, it's falling. He's, falling. Now, he's, now, falling. Like, now, he's not even trying to dive. And now. they're like, he's so brave. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget, nine o'clock tonight, falling. <laughs> There's some falling on TV. You see, to me, it's always what I want to see are the pitch sessions. I want to do right. a series of videos of, of the pitch sessions throughout the history of television. Right. Absolutely. Uh, that would be one of them. How do you pitch a show about people falling into a swimming pool? Incredible. Uh, Hogan's Heroes, you have to, you have, to have that a concentration visual. camp? Yeah, but it's funny. Right. Because the Nazis are stupid. <laughs> yeah. The Nazis are stupid, you're going to love them. Yeah. 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 I always, uh, there's always, there's always a casting uh, roles which I always wonder the same conversation. I remember, uh, I'm sure most people watching and people in the room are as much a fan as, as me of Weekend at Bernie's 2. Sure. Tremendous. Um, we all love Weekend at Bernie's, but a lot of people you know, forget Weekend at Bernie's 2 in which uh, the corpse of Bernie is reanimated through voodoo. That is correct. Um, <laughs> And there's a moment where uh, voodoo, uh, voodoo Bernie is sort of dancing along the beach. And he's a corpse, remember? Keep in mind. Uh, just for those who haven't seen it, he's dead, but he's been reanimated. And he's dancing along, and his foot gets caught in one of those kind of paraglider things, you know, where you yeah, tow behind. Is that what it is? Yeah. Where you towed behind a speedboat. So he gets caught in that. So now he's a corpse that's being kind of dragged along the beach. Mm -hmm. And he, dr he gets dragged across two women who are very attractive, who are sunbathing. Yep. And he rips off their bikinis. Just the, the as tops, he goes, just the, the tops, tops. As and they go, ah, and their boobs are shown, and the corpse goes off down the road, down the, down the beach with their bikinis. But to think about that phone call. Yeah. Janice, good news. <laughs> um, do, you, do you ever see Weekend at Bernie's? <laughs> All right, we'll wait for this. They're doing a sequel. Yeah, roll for you, love. Right. Okay, there's going to be a corpse <laughs> dragging your bikini top off. I mean, and that's it. They don't have lines. No. There's nothing else. That's, their, that's on their IMDb page. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she slaps Barry Bostwick after that. Oh, really? She's very upset. But just, I mean... Let's reenact the whole movie now, just you and me. Generally, nudity is, is in films is confusing to me. Because there's often yeah. nudity... We were talking about this last night, actually. There's often nudity where there's no reason for it. So None. it's just a girl gets out of bed, and then she goes in the shower and that's it. <laughs> Right. No, just, yeah. just we wanted to see some tits. We wanted to see some tits in the show. So, uh, put some tits. <laughs> Get an actress in with the tits. Yep. Right. You know, it's like, just, I mean, I remember, I remember being on a plane and I remember seeing The Thomas Crown Affair and it was uh, Rene Russo and she's on a beach and she's wearing a bikini. And I remember seeing the film originally in the movie theaters and she's topless. So on the day, they went, Rene, we're going to do this with a bikini, and then we're going to get the old tits out yep. so we can see them. Yeah. <laughs> it's just sort of... Alternative. Well, yeah, but why didn't she go, well, if you can do the story with the bikini, I'll just wear the bikini. Yeah. I've always, it's so <laughs> weird. Yeah. Anyway, sorry uh, about that. I started out in stand-up uh, in San Francisco around the same time as Dana Carvey, and he had a similar obsession, which was... Uh, uh, you're familiar with the American brand of uh, briefs, uh, Fruit of the Loom? Sure. So there were commercials where there was a guy they, acting out the various types of fruit. So the, the guy was the grapes, and this guy was the uh, plum, what have you. Sure. And so it was the actor who portrayed the grapes saying, uh, kids, kids, I'm on, it's on now. And then the family gathers, and you see there's daddy as the... As the, as the great. Does that, that happen? Yeah. yeah. Is that, there's a, that sort of sense of family yeah. pride. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's a national spot. Kid. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's a national commercial. That's college fun. And I'm the grapes. Yeah. They make wine from grapes. <laughs> yeah. I I mean, I'm the classiest of the fruit. <laughs> could have been the plum. <laughs> yeah. After all, um, early were, were there any jobs like that as a performer? I mean, there are enough stand-up places, as our dear friend Dana Gould would say, Uncle Fuck's Chuckle Hutch. There, there are enough. Venues that right. made you feel like this is the same as shoveling the shit after the elephant. Right. Um, yes, I guess I never did stand up um, where it was my sole income. Right. So I was always able. But I mean, as a performer or a writer or any aspect. Uh, there I, was... I remember I went for a, a, an audition once for a, for a commercial, for a yogurt commercial, yogurt, as some of you incorrectly say. And um, how should we be saying it? Yogurt. Sure. You're not pronouncing the T. I am yogurt. Okay. But it's not yogurt. All right. Okay. <laughs> All I'm right. speaking English. Right. So if anyone's got an authority on English, yeah, it'll right. be the English one. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's before anyone are, are writes there, in. Are there any herbs in that? <laughs> yogurt? There's no, there's no uh, basil. I see. <laughs> Let me check my schedule to yeah. see if that's. A... <laughs> but um, yeah, I remember sort of sitting there with a bunch of people and then having to go in, and I think they said something like, um, You're eating yogurt, and then a monster tries to steal your yogurt. Just act that. So I was doing lots of 
Yeah! There was that. <laughs> Variations on that. Um, By the way, you're hired from that last. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone and then, else can go. And then Tell I, everyone they can go, Sam. But then I didn't get the job. <laughs> And I just remembered, really? There was a guy who did a better <laughs> eating yogurt being scared by a monster than that? Yeah. And um, that was so humiliating that I, that I generally have avoided those sorts of... Maybe games, they were looking you know. for the Abbott and Costello version. I don't know if you remember the wonderful uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, sure. Abbott and Costello meet the werewolf, or yeah. wolfman. Uh, that, those are always my favorite moments. And, right. and uh, our friend Christopher Guest has um, a word for the sound that the comedian makes, which is faith. Faith. <laughs> right. So you and I are having a conversation as the Abbott and Costello characters, yeah. and then Frankenstein walks up and he's sure. just standing there. Mm -hmm. So listen to me. Remember, Lou, when the guy, when the uh, owner of the warehouse comes around, we got to make sure everything's nice and tidy. Hi, how are you? When we get to Faith, you know, <laughs> right. the double take yeah, word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, uh, it's always the hi, how are you <laughs> beforehand. That's what yeah. put me on the floor. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we'll get to you in a second. Right. Yeah. I'm going to make sure Faith. <laughs> sure. So maybe you needed to. The, that's what I should have done. If only I. <laughs> maybe that's what the guy did, though. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's okay. what he did. Well, yeah. To be fair, Mel Smith is known throughout England as the definitive Faith. yogurt eating scared by a monster. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, that was his whole career for 30 years. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, CD Boss was the original uh, short film. You, you, you stayed around the uh, BBC um, education program long enough to, uh, to get that underway, so right. says the dossier. But there's also a stint working as a writer for Sasha Baron Cohen. No, that's... That's, that's complete... That's, that's BS. Bobby Poppycock and what have you? Yes. No, now, it was... The, 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 Ricky was on a show, ah. a late night sort of satire show, the 11 um, o'clock show. The 11 o'clock show, which Sasha had previously appeared on. And Ricky was one of the people that they brought in once Sasha left. Uh, and I wrote a joke once for Ricky. Oh, I love those. I, so I think it's now it's blurred that I wrote for Sasha as well. Right, right. Um, okay, so then let's go to the, um, the CD boss. I mean, is it just a matter of the right person seeing it? Was it one of those things? Were you guys peddling this thing? Or is it something that you did and thought, finally, we've sort of uh, figured out a way to capture this, this character that makes us both laugh really hard? Well, no, I, it, it was funny, because when we, when we used to work at that radio station where I was Ricky's assistant uh, with, you know, with, the, with the serial balloon, mm -hmm. um, he had three, these three comic observations that he used to do just for fun, like he would just, you know, just, just w which would amuse me, but we, they were never on the radio, they were just things in the office that he would do. Uh, and one of them was, um, was uh, just, just kind, of, kind of observations of, of types of people in offices. Um, and he, you know, he had a bit where he was like, we, he was doing a job interview with a girl. And the idea was that I would sort of be the girl, and we'd just start riffing for fun, and, and sort of I'd cross my legs, and he'd just go, mm. <laughs> <laughs> And then, like, he'd just throw the, her resume on the floor so he could do that. And just little bits like that, very subtle little comic bits that just used to really amuse us, yeah. but had no, there was nothing, we weren't doing anything with them, no. they were just bits. And then I joined the BBC, and while I was there, I did this, I had this day of training where they gave me a camera team, and they said, um, we need you to make a short film just as a training exercise. And it was supposed to be so that I could, you know, I could learn to, to make a little um, film for a local news station. Well, that was the ambition for it. And uh, You'd and I, learn uh, setup, you'd learn editing. You'd right, learn... exactly. It was just, yeah. But it was, you know, and we were supposed to pick a subject and, you know, maybe make a little film about the local barber or something, you know. And I just said to Ricky, why don't we do that character instead? And we'll do it like a, you know, documentary, but, um, but it will be fake. And you know, and that was fine. And I booked this day at an old office that he'd worked at all these years before. And we went there, and and he and I just worked out some bits, and and we shot it as a documentary because it was the quickest way to, to do it. You know, we didn't have to light it too carefully and stuff. But we had a regular f film team and a, and all the stuff, and and we filmed was that it. The international sign for the boom. The international for boom. Yeah. And um, and what was interesting was the film. Just somewhere between that moment in the office doing that little bit and me f sort of f pointing that camera at him, it just it just came out the box, that character, and his performance fully formed. It was incredible. And literally on the day, I remember looking at it, and just it was weird. And he had never acted, he had never done any training, he had never done stand-up comedy, he had never done any of that kind of performance. And it came out sort of almost as it, as it, as it was on TV later. And it was bizarre. And then I went away to edit it, and I remember being so excited by what we had that I remember, this was before mobile phones, because I remember running to a phone box and saying, I've got to bring this tape round, man. You're going to love this. And, and we just, 
it was just sort of, there was like an alchemy that occurred. And then I, because I was at the BBC, I was able to show this to people and, and people started to respond to it and, and off it went. But it was, you know, it was not part of a plan. It wasn't designed to be a pilot. It was just a thing No, to and do. this is before you started doing the radio show and right, podcast. Right, right. This was before everything. And it was, and it really is what led to everything else. And it was... You and I think now, you know, I wonder, like, now, if, if it, with the age of the internet and podcasts, like, would we have just put it up on YouTube and that would have been the end of it? You yeah. Know, I, you know, I, I don't know, but... Yeah. yeah. So it's the, the lack of um, opportunities and, uh, to experiment, the stifling of that kind of creativity that afforded it to breathe and grow and, and sort of um, eat away at you. Both. I guess so. Or maybe nowadays you would put that online and someone would respond to it and pick up on it and maybe they'd bake it into... I don't know whether now is a... I mean, I sometimes, you know, I sometimes think, you know, certainly I wish I'd had the technology that's available now because when I was at, uh, at school or college, to try and make a short film was just such an operation. I remember making a short film at university with, you know, two VHS machines kind of, you know what I mean, and editing all through the night to get kind of four minutes together and just... I mean, it, what a mess. And now you can shoot a film on your... Cell phone, you know. Yeah, uh, and thankfully people are. Yes. Uh, sit there uncomfortably while I invite our sponsor in, won't you? Please. All right. The uh, the fine folks at Ting. Many thanks to Ting for sponsoring our show today. Ting is not just the Irish way of saying thing. Ting is the best nationwide mobile service provider. It's not restrictive, much cheaper than the other options, and much more user friendly than the phone companies you hate. It's a bit presumptuous. Visiting chat.ting.com, here's the tang, will unlock a special deal for you. Check it out now, you son of a bitch, to make the switch and revolutionize how you do mobile. Bit of final ado, just inviting our international friends, to overage charges and termination fees. Vow to never sign a contract again unless you're in Vegas and very, very drunk. We're also brought to you by Hangover 3. Ting even gives you your money back when you don't use what you paid for. How about that, you son of a bitch? Ting lets you pay based on your actual phone usage. Name another company that does that. Name one. I'll wait. Go. Do it. Nope. Oh, I, I shouldn't move when they're buffering. Nope. Yeah, when they do the buffer gag, oh, I shouldn't move. Otherwise, it's not as... Go to chat.ting.com now to find out more. Do something good for yourself. You deserve it for being a KPCS listener or viewer. Kevin Pollack's chat show thanks you. Get $25 off your device or $25 in service credit using that URL. What's that URL again, you ask? Thank you. It's chat.ting.com. Uh, so... You, you guys got the short. Ricky sees it. He says, fuck, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, that's exactly what he said. Yeah, sure. Well I read the quote. <laughs> um, and then quite a bit of time goes by with the radio show becoming the podcast mm -hmm. before you what? Have enough of a foothold within that can't be related to the actual location or station or what have you, or even the people who were initially producing or funding the podcast. Well, the, 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 the radio station that we originally started on um, launched the day after Princess Diana died. And people weren't really in the mood for, uh, you know, alternative college rock. They weren't. And, um, and uh, irreverent funny. comic uh, observations. Day after. The day after. So it never really got off to a great start, that station, and it struggled on for a little while. And uh, it was eventually taken over by a larger corporation, a big radio conglomerate. And they very quickly realized that Ricky should be fired, along with me, who was moonlighting from the BBC at the weekends to do a radio show. And um, so we, you know, we kind of, but we had other things cooking. I think the office was sort of in its early stages. And then once the office took off and Ricky became a big star, they obviously came crawling back to invite us back to the radio station. And we went back um, as reigning champions in our heads. And that was where we met Carl, because Carl, by this point, was working there, and we were too big to press the buttons and play the records. So they brought us this this guy with a round head, and 
and off we went. And so um, we did that show for a couple of years in between seasons of writing The Office and extras. So it was after being fired that you were able to take the short film and, and uh, pitch it? It was sort of happening it. alongside that, yeah. And right. so by the time we got fired from the station, The, the Office was sort of in the, in the sort of machines of the TV world, right. you know, machine. And I like reading about, um, in the dossier provided to us by Jason McIntyre, um, how you sort of came to uh, creating the various cast members of The Office in terms of having kind of a list or ideas of these characters you had both observed in various office jobs. And what about this one? What about that one? Right. At one point, there was an older cleaning lady who didn't quite make sense once factored in with the other chemistry right. of characters yeah. and who possibly appeared in one episode in one scene at some point down mm -hmm. the line. Um, but I like the sort of breakdown of why Tim was necessary to counterbalance right. David Brent and then why Gareth was then necessary to uh, unnerve and make uh, Tim so very, very unhappy. Right. Well, yes, in that original thing that we made just that first day, uh, uh, Ricky was there and there was a receptionist, an actress friend of mine just played the receptionist, and then I popped up as a kind of employee. And then when we came to do a f an official pilot, we just spent weeks just listing all the people we'd worked with in offices and the kind of kinds of people that we'd met. And then we realized very quickly that a lot of our friends um, were guys, you know, approaching 30 who were kind of stuck in jobs that were not bad jobs, they were just kind of dull and that they somehow had just drifted into that, that it wasn't an ambition, rather like the job Ricky was doing before, you know, we got together was, you know, it wasn't a bad job, it was just he, he wasn't his, he was going to be a musician and suddenly he's yeah. in an office somewhere. And they, so you realize it's people kind of just treading water, just, just trying to keep their head above water and they've maybe got a nice little house and a car and life's okay. But none of them are thinking in terms of the word career. Right, no. right. So, and that's, I would suspect, a huge majority of, of the working, white collar working force in the UK and certainly here. And so we, so we thought, well, this, this seems very real and this is a kind of, this is a nice person that people will relate to and this is what, this is sort of the entry point because our crazy character, the boss, is a little kind of extreme so we need someone to balance him with. So sort of that came in and then we're like, well now, the problem is whenever we'd worked in offices, there had always been someone who was very officious, who was obsessed with the kind of the rules and, you know, the, the make sure you wear your pass, you know, and just kind of, just a, a sure. sort of, you know, you know, that sort of person. And so that seemed like someone we'd always experienced. Right. And so we figured, well, we'll put them into the mix because that will be a funny character. But then what's his relationship with the boss? What's his relationship with the other employee? And you realize that the guy who's just trying to get by would kind of be bumping heads because he just wants an easy life and this guy's not making it easy. So that's a fun clash. And then this guy is obviously, he, he respects the chain of command, so he's going to have a lot of respect for the boss. And so it just sort of suggested itself, you know, and, and so it went on really. And that's how we kind of built it up. But it was all born of, of observations and conversations uh, about the people we'd work with. And so someone like the cleaning lady, we'd had these experiences of sort of eccentric cleaners and stuff. But once we put it in the mix, it just seemed kind of gimmicky. It yeah. seemed kind of sitcomy. Sitcomy. So she kind of got ebbed away. And other characters we thought would be important weren't, and other ones bubbled up. So, um, you know, it was, it was probably the most organic thing that I've ever done right. uh, as a writer or as a performer or anything. Well, get into the writing, because it's um, at some point it's everything. Right. So you and Ricky have a chemistry in the office, first making each other laughs with balloon-filled uh, uh, breakfast yeah. cereal. And then the short film, which was, I imagine, somewhat scripted, but not completely. Right. Um, neither of you had uh, a lengthy background mm -hmm. of, of writing in a sitcom structure. Right. Um, and when someone says, yeah, sure, we'll make a pilot of this, you had no real um, uh, work, Track record or anything. Work, yeah. but even workflow or scripts, spec, right. even spec scripts. Sure. There was nothing to show. Right. That's a, a, another sort of beautiful part of it. But here you are, careful what you wish. It's all coming into place. You now have to sit down and write right. six episodes. Um, what is the initial work a relationship like in terms of that? Is it two friends at that point that are constantly spitballing? Well, the first, the first thing I remember was we spent a long time talking about what we didn't like. Great. Endless conversations about what we didn't like in TV, what we, what we, what we responded to, but particularly what we hated, and lots of bad-mouthing about all kinds of stuff across, like. the, across the ages, which obviously I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> um, really? No, of course. 
uh, because subsequently I've met many of those people and I've claimed to be big fans. Right. When, when, I, when, I, when obviously I'm not. Right. Um, so uh, there's lots of that. And Isn't was, that, by the way, a beautiful part of this? Uh, it, 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 clearly it's not show business, it's human nature. Right. Um, well, there's a point at which you have enough of a reputation that if you were to sort of badmouth someone, it will somehow get back to them, or particularly with the world of the internet. If I say something here, you know, not that anyone particularly cares what might, but somehow, probably what would happen is I would say something and then Ricky would get the blame. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why I would be careful to, uh, to do it. But yeah, there was lots of, but also we talked a lot about films and about music and about tone. And it wasn't that we had all, any experience, it was just we had, I guess, taste, right. or a taste that we thought was right or what, what we wanted to see. And Ricky was very scrupulous about realism and probably far more so than I, and was obsessed with realism. And that, so that governed a lot of it. Did it feel real? Did it feel con convincing? But what was interesting was between that short film and the series, we made an, an official pilot and we tried to make it more like TV. And in doing that, it felt phony. And we shot this pilot, which is, I don't think has ever been aired, but which just somehow felt sitcom -y. You mean it locked it. off cameras? No, no, no. It was the same, same docu-style, but just the story was more neat and... And, and there was a sort of payoff to this, and it, right. it just all felt about a bit more constructed. And I remember we watched it, and we just were really panicked. We thought whatever there was in that first thing we'd done, whatever kind of weird essence of truth and realism that people had responded to, we had somehow lost it. And so we kind of went back to the drawing board, and we tried to think what was that that we'd lost. And what we realized was it, that it couldn't feel neat, you know, that it had to feel like a documentary, and a documentary is assembled from hours of footage. And so it doesn't quite, Chime bits are missing, and the story is not really jumps. a story, you know. And yeah, and so. Well, you say go back to the drawing board. Do you mean to say that you looked at a finished edit, right, and said let's throw this away? We said they, it was enough to get us the season, but it, but we knew it was wrong and shouldn't be the first episode. So, so you we, had to go back and say let us reshoot. So that we first. reshot. So in the end, the the stuff that made the the, the final cut in the that was broadcast, we'd sort of shot it three times. <laughs> In one way or another. So by that point, it was in you know it was in fairly good shape, and and just the whole time of doing that, the characters had kind of, you know, had kind of coalesced more. Right. And so by the time we got got sort of to the series, we for some reason it just all fell into place. It was weird the casting, but the casting I remember, we were panicked. We we because we were so inexperienced. We were like, there's no actors that will be able to replicate the realism we're after. I mean, it's just impossible. <laughs> so we're going to need real people. Oh no! And then we saw a few real people, and they're terrible. Obviously, that's <laughs> yeah. why they're real people. <laughs> and so then we got actors in, and we went through hundreds. I mean, we must have seen everyone. And and then one or two people were great, and that's who made it into the show. Right. And um, but the whole time it was funny because we we had this sort of confidence, this weird kind of almost arrogant approach. Like, oh yeah. Like, well, how hard can it be? You know, it's it's TV. It's a sitcom. Yeah, we can do this. And then all the way along, we were discovering how hard it is. And um, every step of the way. Shoot, I remember we, the first week we shot way too much, and, they, and the producer said, "You cannot shoot this much." Footage. I mean, we had stacks of tapes from like day one. Just, just kept the camera going from every angle because we had no sense of like what we needed and yeah. what, what were we gonna, you know. And then very quickly, you know, you sort of you you learn what you need. And what was the co-directing like? I mean, he's on camera, you're not. But again, so it's sort of, we, had, what did we, we had nothing to compare it to. So, but I mean, what was the process we, between the two of you? What was do a take and then he would watch video playback right I would afterwards? Talk with the, I would talk with the cameraman while he was sort of rehearsing with the actors. And then we would come together and I would tell him about what I'd planned and he would talk about that. And then we would do it. And then he would normally, once he had seen one take, he was happy with the shot. Then we would just keep going and I would throw in any thoughts and right. uh, that was that was that wasn't a problem it was just that we I think it was more we were fearful of what, what the crew would think I remember we had a meeting on sort of day one all the crew were there and uh, there's that phrase in um, in TV I don't know if you use the same phrase here but when they start the camera they say turn over okay uh, in the UK which just means you know, get the camera rolling and, uh, and I said don't worry you know we, we've not been in the business uh, long but we know what we're talking about we know all the terms you know uh, action cut roll over and someone went turn over turn over yeah <laughs> um, and it was just you know it was just like just this fear that kind of like all these old hands who've been in the business 30 years were like who are these idiots you know yeah. what do they know and sort of that was I remember we were kind of anxious about it. and and then I remember we saw a first cut from the first week's filming, and we got a little drunk together, and we watched it, and we were panicked because we were like, "This is terrible. This is just what a mess." And then I thought, and then I remember saying, "No, let me go in with the editor because I think he's trying to cut it like a regular sitcom, 
not, and it can't be like a regular sitcom. It has to, it has to have all this dead time, all this sort of silence and jumping around and jumping around. And, and we went in and, and and we kind of recut it, and suddenly we were relieved because oh no, this is making sense. This does feel real. Right. This does feel kind of, um, and and then we were sort of off to the races, really. Well, it would be interesting to see if uh, the editor, as he's first hearing or she first hearing your suggestions of, of slowing it down and muddying it up right. and not making it so clean, how confounded yeah. that person was. Because well, he was, what was great about him was that he was fairly new to this, so it was like we were all just Perfect. just going along. He was Perfect. like, "Yeah, okay, let's try it." Yeah, we had Peter Farrelly, the Farrelly brothers, here last week, and he was saying their first thing, Dumb and Dumber. He hadn't directed right anything. Yeah, a moment. No, anything. Yeah, and went to had the wherewithal to go to the crew and say, "Okay, we don't know shit from Shinola. Right, we're not going to pretend for a moment that we do." So, not only if anybody has any ideas, let us know them. But please understand, we don't know what lens means. Right, let alone the size of the lens. Yeah. Um, but it's funny because it's amazing how what the value that brings is the same thing. You know, when you see like a soap opera actor. And you sometimes feel, I don't know, I always feel that they're not trying to replicate human life. Right. They're trying to replicate other soap opera acting. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And it's sort of, and that seemed to me was like, I feel like, you know, if you're very experienced, there's a danger that you're sort of trying to replicate other TV. Right. As a sort of, because that's how it's done. Right. And we were kind of lucky in a way because we didn't know the trick, so we were only obsessed with whether it felt real. That was all we cared about. I think it's true of every art form. You know, you start as a comedian replicating right. your favorites. Right. Until you find your own rhythm and voice. Yeah. yeah. And it's got to be true to, to a painter or, or yeah. a writer. Or, and you guys were finding your way. That's sort of the beautiful thing about the first six episodes. Right. Um, I would imagine. So let's jump to the point where it becomes adapted, not only here in America, just the timing couldn't be better, finishing its ninth season, I think, uh, this last Thursday. Was that the end yeah, of it? it yeah. Yep. yeah. But also in French, German, nothing funnier, I'm assuming, than that version. Uh, Canada and uh, Norwegian. Uh, oh, they've done version. a Norwegian one? That's I didn't what know. It, what it I know there's a Chilean one, right? there's an Israeli one. Uh, I've often joked that I'd like to see a Japanese one where they just do a really good day's work and then go home. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the German one, I think, is unofficial. I think they they just they didn't actually ask official permission, but I may be wrong. So ah, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, so uh, there you go. No, the Germans don't ask for permission. Right. Just ask All right. Okay. Day. What? All right. What? Forgive and forget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some, yeah. The original <laughs> Occupy. Yeah. Um, uh, well, you, you, you have now created a question for me, which is how much involved, uh, I was going to ask it originally, uh, I assume in the American version. So you're saying these other countries are not all asking permission. Uh, I think Germany's the only one where, they, where, they, where we have to take issue with it. So yeah, in the, the case of the other ones, um, Chile. Yeah, well, I don't speak Chilean. Sure. <laughs> So um, <laughs> I've yeah not been heavily involved with that. What do they speak over there? Chile? Is it Spanish? Spanish maybe? Not Portuguese, because well, that's popular over there as well. Yeah, Brazil. Um, Portuguese. Brazil's Portuguese, right? Um, so you have um, the, the American solicitors is, and agents ringing you up saying, "Guess what? Uh, looks like we're going in another country." And right. they tell you the name of the country, and you say, "Terrific." Yeah. And then they're going to do whatever the fuck they want. Right. But in the case of America, where we're um, speaking a version of the same yes. language. Um, how involved were you guys initially, and then? Well, this the, uh, the the credit that I that I think Ricky and I can take is that uh, be, being something of a fan of comedy and a bit of a historian of comedy, you know, before I started, the thing I'd noticed was that most adaptations of a British show had failed. In fact, the last one that was a success uh, of a comedy was uh, we had a show called Steptoe and Son um, about a father and son, kind of uh, kind of a junkyard workers. Bum, bum, right, which was remade as Sanford and Son. And Sanford and Son was the last time a successful adaptation had been made that tells you how long from a British show. And I guess that must have stopped, stopped in, the, in the early 80s or something. And so I would look at these things they tried to adapt, and I was always wondering, like, what was the problem? And I realized that so often, sort of looking in the kind of history of it, that the original creators had, had demanded heavy involvement in the remake. And that seemed to me the flaw, because um, firstly, what do I know really about the mechanics of working in an office? in America. I mean, I, I feel like I know America, but I don't really know the little mechanics. Like when, when they did the French version, 
I didn't realize that, you know, we, we decided they go out for drinks after work. But it turns out that one of the traditions in French offices is on a Friday night, you'll often have a glass of champagne, you know, in the office, which is sort of quite unique to France, I guess, because champagne being more sort of readily available. And so little kind of details like that that seem very specific culturally. Right. And I knew that we were going to struggle if we tried to replicate our version because we wouldn't know those little details, but also that I think we, we'd have been too busy trying to replicate everything about ours. We'd have been trying to find an exact Ricky replica, you know what I mean? And we, basically we were too close. We'd done our version of the song and now we were going to try and do it with different musicians. It sure. just, and so I think the one thing we, we, we knew is that it was sort of imperative that we let them do it. And the most we could do was to sort of help choose the team so we had a lot of meetings with people and we met ultimately Greg Daniels who did it. And we just knew that he, he seemed in tune with the spirit of the show and, he, and we met up with him in London and he asked us tons of questions about what this was and in, in, for himself to try and get a sense of what the American equivalents would be. And then we pretty much left them to it. And I remember them sending tapes of, of Carell and, and people and us looking and going, you don't want this guy. You know, it's just, you know, no, just because we couldn't see what they were seeing because we all we were thinking is well he doesn't look like Ricky he doesn't have right. Ricky's beard you know what I mean we just yeah. we couldn't we couldn't compute what he was going to become right. and luckily they they obviously you know ignored us and rightly so yeah um, so so I th that's the only real credit we can take and that was really our involvement in those early days yeah I mean it was easy for me to assume based on what I've seen of Ricky Sheriff himself either in talk shows or on stage as a comedian that he professes to take great, tremendous pride in being lazy. So the right. notion that he might turn to you and say, you know, what if we did nothing and just took the checks? Right, right. But it, I think it's important to hear what you just shared, which is there was a conscious effort by way of uh, taking a look at why these things didn't ever work. Right, but also I remember they would send us tapes and they did invite our involvement. And we would, in the early days, we would offer notes and comments. But I just remember even then thinking, oh, I don't think this is going to be valuable to them. I, I just felt like we didn't understand American TV. We, know ours didn't, we never had to have commercial breaks in our version. Just simple things like that, which just changed the whole structure and dynamic of it. You yeah. Know? Were you aware of the American fans, unfortunately I was one of them, who consider themselves ahead of the curve? Right. When they heard there was going to be an American version, were outraged, of course, uh, with some sort of nonsensical pride and right. proprietary ownership mm -hmm. of their fan fandom versus the 97, 93 to 97 percent of the nation that had never seen it that or heard of it. didn't yeah, know what the course. fuck everybody else was talking about. Well, it's funny because I remember in England um, it went from this, again, it was so inevitable because, uh, again, it, I, British comedians tend to have a very specific trajectory, which is that you're the new kids on the block, they love you, people, everyone's behind you. Then you sort of become a little bit too familiar, so everyone hates you. And then if you can stay the course, you become a national treasure. <laughs> and, um, and so we were entering, as the American version was happening, we were entering that middle phase of kind of, not these guys again. And I remember that the press in England, it started from, how dare the Americans try and remake this gem, oh. to, um, wait a minute, the American version is better. It just shows that Gervais and Merchant really weren't as good as we all thought they were. Oh. And it was sort of, it just, you just saw the, the swing, the inevitable swing. Wow. And now they, they love the American version and, and we're kind of, you know, pariahs. And uh, not, that's not quite true, but you know what I mean? There was, there but was that a went on of, for a while? It can't still be the case. No, now it's, now it's... Um, You've come back the other way and... No, no not treasures. quite. No, 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 not quite. No, you no, don't want to say no, it, we're not We're not national treasures yes, yet. Yes, you no. are. No, I can I... assure you we're not. <laughs> No, no. Refuse to accept we're that. In a, we're in our, we're in our kind of, we're in the, um, the dark period, you know, where we're just, this is, this could, but this could go on for 20 or 30 years. We're only national treasures when we hit like, you know, 70. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, and in fact, the follow up with extras was just a giant, now what, let's see if this is possible to repeat the sort of magic these two are capable of. Right. Uh, before we uh, get on to that, we invite folks uh, watching from all over the planet to write in, either beforehand or ahead of time. Jamie has forwarded me this particular uh, offering. One of the things we do on the show is have the guest design a series of five questions specifically for uh, the listeners and viewers, design them for the guest. Very specific to your uh, um, career or, 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 or life. You'll see these are um, Coke or Pepsi, this or that, no correct answer, opinions okay. versus. Uh, we call them Tweet Five. Tweet Five. 
T5, T5 forever now. Hey, it's Todd Packer. Hey, thank you. <laughs> uh, at Eric Mullen, this one comes from the Twitterverse. Uh, are you ready for your five questions, yes. sir? Easter or Christmas? Christmas. The Queen or Freddie Mercury? Mercury. <laughs> also correct. Cl clotted cream or Velveeta? I don't know what Velveeta is. <laughs> Perfect. Soccer or football? Football. Jamisons or Bushmills? Jamisons. You got all correct. Thank you. Including I don't know what Velveeta is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, uh, you should sample it. It is, um, I should maybe let Jamie describe it uh, in, its all, in all of its glory. Uh, it's it's a, like a process. It's not cheese. It's like a cheese substitute, but it melts very well. So it's used in like sauces or to like make like macaroni. It's a cheese things. substitute? Yeah. Do you imagine? It's, it's a long real. block of it too. It's processed and like re manufactured cheese into this long square rectangle thing. So, but it is cheese, it's not, it's it not. It tastes like cheese, but it's not cheese. There's no actual so dairy. Someone, someone somewhere said, this cheese, this, we, we can do better than this. <laughs> yeah. We can do better than cheese. We're gonna come yeah. up with our own synthetic yeah. cheese. Yeah. I, I, oh, I'm, this I'm is not water at all, it's tea. Can we do another tea, please? Would you like another? Please. Yeah, yeah. If, David, could we do that? If I may offer a counter. I'm gonna water this one down first. You're correct. It is. It is not worth it. It's not worth no, it. No, right. go for real cheese, because right. it's not any healthier no. than real cheese. Is the problem? Well, it was never designed to be healthier. It was designed back in a time when those things weren't even considered. Right. It was, in fact, as you suggested, we can do better. That is to say, we can mass produce a cheaper version than dairy. Right. Than right. dairy. It's, probably. Yeah, exactly. It's the poor. But man's. for grilled cheese, when you're a kid, there's Kraft Singles, which, uh, which became the, the the norm. But at some point, also, there was this. Um, yeah, the cup. Sure. All right, come on in. Don't be frightened. Get right in. Oh there. no, he's in here for his own venture. He wants. Oh, to, he needs I a charger. Can I be controversial? I'm Please. not a fan of some of the American cheeses. Let's discuss a few. <laughs> um, Monterey Jack. The, yeah. No, you're the, right. The to me. I mean, sorry, call me controversial, but you know, we're from Europe. Yeah. I think we. I think we can do cheese. What's your Thanks cheese very of much. choice? Uh, well, obviously, I love a, a mature, strong, mature English cheddar. Uh, but I'll go for a lovely Stilton. I don't. I'm not. I'm not unpartial to um, to you know a camembert. Camembert, very delicious. Um, so you know, just I, I just thought I'd throw in a kind of little little bomb there into the <laughs> an otherwise pleasant afternoon. Well, I think um, I think that uh, we came over here initially, uh, started our own thing. Sure. And wanted it, to mark yourself out from the European cheese. As a way to <laughs> yeah. further distance yeah. ourselves from the motherland. Right. There had to be a reinvention of cheese. Sure. The problem was we didn't have all those dank English castle basements. Sure. To let it That's where know. most of our cheese is made in castles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I've learned anything. This is why I hesitated on the Queen Freddie Mercury question, because down in the basement of the palace, she's got a lot of cheese going on there. Can't Imagine the sharp yeah. cheddar yeah. that yeah. they've got. You meant that biologically, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. down, down in the royal basement, there's a lot of cheese. What a euphemism that would be. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the name of my second book. <laughs> um, how does David take his tea with a little bit of milk, please? Hot with a little bit of milk. How does David, David. How does Stephen take his tea? Oh, that's a question from David. I, I jumped ahead. My eyes like to jump around. But you know what? While you're asking, David, how do you take your... We'll find out later. Yeah, David, I guess I really was more curious how you took yours. That's a good point. Um, all right, we, you've, done, you've enjoyed that first one so much. Let's go to at Rene French, who offers this tweet five. T5. Okay, good. T5. T5. This is just a question. Mr. Merchant, could you please talk about the experience you had involving a Volvo estate and someone named Vera. You know what, I'm not gonna go into the mechanics of this now, only because um, I feel like I've told it before and I, the version I told before I'm sure was definitive. Okay. And I feel like to try and kind of relive the glory years. Um, but, you know, um, it just, in, in brief, I was trying to impress a girl. I was at a party, I was about 16 or 17. I borrowed my father's car. Um, I, uh, in order to impress her, I tried to steal a pig. 
from a you know what? Art. It's better left right there. Yeah. That's what you more couldn't. You, to you could not have piqued my curiosity more. Perhaps right. you could tell us where we might find the. I have no idea. Perfect. It was said, I think, in one of those early radio shows, which I'm sure some uh, I'm some. Sh I'm sure you can find a clip of it from uh, XFM sure or the, or from the, XFM, the old radio show. Okay. So I'm sure it's out there. Somewhere. Thank you for that suggestion, then, at Renee French, who's a dear friend of the show. Uh, the tweet file just below it, though, I guess I should go to this one from at, and we've already done the thing, so don't run it again. At Robert Banesh, because that's a name. Uh, Golden Globe or Guinness World Record? Uh, I think probably the Globe. Five, seven, or six, seven? I wish I could expand on that. Pardon, go on. No, you can't expand on five, it. Five, six, or we seven? We will. Five, seven, five foot, seven inches, or six foot, seven inches? Oh, six or seven. Yeah. XFM or podcast? Pod. Pod. Laughing at Carl or yelling at Carl? Oh, always laughing. Fred Flintstone or Ricky Gervais? Yeah, was there any comment when it went to HBO as an animated thing that they had sort of dialed in Ricky's face a little bit like... Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, we talked to them about the idea that it should evoke the kind of Hanna-Barbera style. Right. But with, um, but with us just saying utter nonsense. Right. Was, was this something that was pitched to you guys by someone else? I think it was inspired by the fact there had been a lot of kind of web fan stuff, yeah. similarly, where people were sort of animating it right. and uh, just off their own back, you know, and, and it was bringing kind of different energy and life to it. And I think someone said, you know, well, maybe we should do this as a bigger thing. Um, uh, and what was interesting was, you know, there's a whole, a whole, whole different audience because, you know, there's a lot of people that you will be shocked to discover don't listen to podcasts. Yeah, and so, um, even though you have 280 million downloads. I don't even, I'm still not sure I believe that number. Right. Do you know what I mean? That, I think that's like, that's like 14 super fans just downloading it endlessly. I can't believe that's, that's no, that can't be right. That can't be right. Here's why it's Big right. Big and Thai prisons. But that's not, that's not 240 million different people. I think that's, I don't know what the, I'd like to see the breakdown. Oh, of no, it couldn't be different people. It's just uh, individual downloads. So really? one person could download every episode. Right. But not multiples of each episode. I see. But to give you uh, statistics, I mean, um, while shows like this get a million a month, there are That's shows like Adam you. Carolla getting a million a week. Really? So 280 million is not impossible. I guess so. In yeah. the brief time that you guys did your thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, the Golden Globe does expand a little bit. I think what was interesting about the Golden Globes was it was the first time that we'd come here um, and. You know, our experience was we, 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 we came here for the Golden Globes, we'd been nominated, the show, our version of The Office had been nominated uh, as sort of best sitcom, and it was up against whatever was big then, the Frasier or whatever it was. And so we came and we had a meeting with BBC America and they said, uh, there's no way you're going to win, so just enjoy the day, enjoy the ceremony, it'll be fun. And we went in a limousine, we'd never been in a limousine before. And, uh, Seriously? I don't think I'd ever been in a limousine, and we kind of drive the Golden Globes and it's like the middle of the afternoon. You know, had you starts, been to America? I'd been to America briefly before, but this was... But briefly and not as a star of a show right, right. and not being feted right, in any exactly. way, shape or form. Exactly. And so they were, someone was paying for the hotel and the limousine and we arrived. And I remember we were on the way and Ricky, I said, have you eaten? Once again, the parent. I said, have you eaten? I ordered some room service because we may not eat for a long time. We're, le we're leaving the hotel at two in the afternoon. When's the food going to be? He, right, he said, you're right, I'm starving. So we had to pull the limousine into like a gas station and he bought some sort of Cheetos. <laughs> and then he's sort of eating this bag of Cheetos in the limo, but now he's like covered in kind of orange dust and grunt. So now we're like using ice from the kind of ice tray to like clean his teeth. <laughs> On the way, like, you know those people that kind of, the real sort of trailer park people who win the lottery? He, that was what he, he was like. He was like, you know, the kind of lottery winner. Um, taking him out. I remember, I remember the, 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 the Desperate Housewives got out of a limousine. I remember thinking, there's no way that, that in that car, Terry Hatcher was saying to Eva Longoria, you've got something between your teeth. You've got, <laughs> what is that? There's spinach. When did you eat spinach? You right. eat... And, Although um, I can guarantee you that exactly. I'm sure that does that, happen. Yeah. And so then we went in the ceremony, and I remember we, you know, there was Tom Cruise and, and George Clooney and all these people, and just, just, you know, kind of dumbstruck by the fact that it, it felt like we were in the very hub of of sort of show business and movies and but also TV and movies are combined at the Golden Globe, so that was also weird and that dazzling. That party atmosphere probably was perfect for your uh, uh, breaking of your cherry, as it were. Right. Um, 
because all other award shows are you're in a cramped seat and it's terrible right. and it's a but theater. But there's a bit looser. And and there's and drinking, there's eating, people are hobnobbing right. from table to table. It couldn't have been more And then party so life. as we were making our way to the table, people were coming, you know, Danny DeVito said hi and was a fan and that was like confusing to us and weird. And then we sat at this table and we were kind of, and normally when we'd won awards in England, we were always looking for the ramp because our producer is in a wheelchair. And we always knew we were maybe with a chance if there was a ramp to the stage. We couldn't see a ramp, uh, so that was worrying. And we were right out on the sort of corner of the stage. And then um, everyone kept saying, don't worry, just enjoy it, you're not going to win. And then they said uh, best show, best sitcom was The Office. And I remember we saw the televised version afterwards. And the camera couldn't even find us. Right? The, camera, <laughs> the camera is searching for There us. wasn't someone like this no, before the announcement? No, it was weird. It was like, there I don't was... know whether they've smoothed that out since, but certainly there, but the camera's the... like seeking for us and you can't see any of us and they're just looking for heads. Um, and then, thank you. And then, um, uh, then we go up on the stage and I remember uh, we saw, we look at and you saw, I remember seeing Nicolas Cage and, and uh, um, Clint Eastwood and I'm pretty certain I saw Clint Eastwood turn and go. <laughs> <laughs> it was bizarre. And then so Ricky did this speech, and he was very funny. And feel free to drop the tea bag onto will. the uh, yeah. And um, is it is it in there? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, yes. And um, yeah, it's the American way of making tea. You leave the bag inside. Sure, the I'll cup. pop that down there so as to uh, not ruin the aesthetic of this. Yeah, because this table is this table is beautiful, tremendous. Um, and. Um, and just so now the camera was, just... was not usually when they announced the nominees. Right. There's a camera yeah, right in front so of you so that we can get it. your reaction of losing. Right. This is for what no was so other reason. Weird. Maybe it was different then. It was a while. I I just remember seeing the footage and there's and it's searching around for us, and then the voiceover says. Uh, uh, and I don't know why, because Ricky's surname is Gervais, and maybe because it's it's originally French Canadian. So the announcer describes us, and coming to the stage, the creators, Stephen Merchant and Ricky Gervais. <laughs> <laughs> like, we kind of, like we were these sort of French luminaries. <laughs> and, we, and we went Did up you there. hear that at the, in the no, time? No, not at the Later. time, only since. And then, <laughs> so we were kind of giddy with excitement because we'd won this award. Sure. And then Ricky won as a performer and went up there and just kind of ad-libbed and was hilarious. And it was just... Surreal. It was surreal because it was because it felt like from sort of naught to, to 100. You know, like we, yeah. we'd gone there with the kind of, with excitement, but with just a feeling of, oh, how nice to be in the hotel. You know, how nice for someone to fly us here. You know, you being won. told you're not going to win. And you then just won like, because you got the trip. You won because you got to go to the Golden Globes and, right. and see all those people right. and be at that party. Right. By the way, that's why the saying is true. It's great just to be nominated because you get all right. those things. Absolutely. It's a tremendous victory. Yeah. Yeah, and it was, and it was, and just so, so the, to, to the win as well was just so ridiculous. It was just crazy. Yeah. We just had these objects, and suddenly we, it's like we were legitimized in America, which for I think both of us, but particularly for me, you know, I'd grown up adoring, you know, Roseanne and Cheers and Friends, particularly it was a big influence of Mash, and sort of just you know, and seeing kind of clips of those sort of shows in the kind of yeah. in the little sort of bits in between, you know, it just I don't know, it just felt very. It felt like a sort of being invited to the big table, you know, and that was it was very really thrilling. And then moved into the center seat. So right. the party afterwards, because you actually have these wonderful trophies in your hand. Right. Um, uh, does it get weirder or just instantly intoxicated with actual? Uh, just, just. I mean, it's just that feeling of you know you're at a party and people are coming up and saying they'd seen the show and that they were enjoy they'd enjoyed the show. And that was confusing, you know. Just just the idea that that people who you'd seen in films had seen our show. That I remember when we found out Samuel L. Jackson had seen it, and I just and he said I think he said he watched it at home. And I just in my mind it was like, where does he live? What's his house like? Is he in his slippers? <laughs> Did he have to like peel the cellophane off the off the wrapper of the DVD? I can't I can't get it started. I can't <laughs> get a knife. Get a knife. Like I couldn't. I remember but, someone told me that David Bowie watched it. I think Moby, we read an interview that Moby, the musician Moby, had been at David Bowie's house and they watched The Office. And it's like, but in your mind, David Bowie is wearing the full Ziggy Stardust outfit, <laughs> kind of, you know, watching The Office. And it was just, that was what was so strange to us. Well, let's jump cut right to that moment in Extras when you're directing Bowie, uh, silly mm. little fat man. Right, right. Uh, 
do you think back, or, or what is the... Well, the funniest thing was that Ricky had met Bowie somewhere. Ricky was a super Bowie fan, like the biggest Bowie fan in the 70s, and in his early music career, he kind of emulates Bowie. Well, there's not, not sort of or kind of. He is, right, He yeah. wants to be. And I don't know how he... I think he felt he must have met him somewhere. And I remember he said, uh, we were trying to negotiate with Bowie to, to, to be in the show, and, and Ricky said, oh, I spoke to David Bowie earlier. And I remember this was, he said, uh, he, said he, um, he picked up the phone, Oh, he called him and he said, Bowie went, hello, Rick, sorry, mate, I'm just eating a banana. <laughs> and it was just, it was so amazing to us that David Bowie would just eat a banana. <laughs> you know what I mean? But again, in your mind, you're like, uh, Iman, have we got any bananas, love? <laughs> These are a bit off. It's like, you know what I mean? You just don't imagine that he does anything that pedestrian. And, um, and of course, this is, you know this, having worked with all kinds of stars, is that there's a point at which, for all of their eccentricities, and they, they have to live in the real world. Yeah. I mean, yes, we can say they don't live in the real world and they live in bubbles and whatever, but, but they still have to wash and eat and travel places and do... They've still got to do things, you know, they've still got to exist and yeah. eat. And, and, and that was what you started to realise was that, oh, actually, you know, it's not to do with fame, it's just some people are pricks and some people aren't. That's you know? right. and, and that's the distinction of celebrity. It's not to do with that fame corrupts everyone, it just corrupts people who were already assholes. It just <laughs> makes them bigger assholes, is really my experience yeah. of celebrity. And um, so someone like David Bowie, he comes to the set and he's just great, like he's just talk, he was talking about like whatever was on TV the night before and and just fun and he, we'd written these lyrics for this song and he, we sent it to him and he'd composed a tune. And, um, and I remember Ricky had said to him, could it, could, it, could it sound a bit like Heroes? And he went, oh, you just want me to write another Heroes, do you? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, and, but just with, with good humor, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so it was just that stuff of just you realized kind of that, that you, it, the, the, the excitement was seeing that these people were real and existing. Well, not just real, but how about that they're fans of yours? I mean, I mean crazy. I yeah. Mean, just insane. Yeah. That, that's the part of your brain that kind of has to explode. Right. Um, yeah. The, imagine the ego that hears uh, a hero like Bowie as a fan and says, well, yeah, of course. Right. Imagine that. Uh, it's, 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 it's wild. And, you know, I remember, I mean, what the original idea with extras was that we were going to have these stars, but they were literally going to be extras. They yeah, weren't I, even going to speak. I saw idea. that in the dossier and thought that that was pretty spectacular, how you would say, well, we'll get, you know, the Kate Winslet's and whatnot, but they'll, they'll be our extras. They'll be in the background doing the real movie or TV right. show, whatever it is we're filming. You'll never see them speak. Uh, as a concept, I can imagine no hipper, more fantastic right. usage right. of marquee names. The problem with it is it's a Pyrrhic victory. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like, you, oh, well, again, you want to go, oh, well done. But it's not funny or interesting in the end. And so when Kate Winslet says she's going to do it, you're like, oh, well, off we go. Yeah. But this is, you know, this is the other thing. Like, I remember, so we had this idea that Kate Winslet uh, is desperately trying to win an Oscar and is doing a Holocaust movie for, with the sole intention of winning an Oscar. And then later she realizes if you play a person of disability, like Daniel Day-Lewis in My Left Foot, you can also win an Oscar. And so she, this is her plan. And then sub subsequently, a couple of years later, she did win an Oscar for indeed a movie with a backdrop of the Holocaust, uh, the, the Reader, I think it was called. Mm. And, um, and then, you know, again, but the, so Ricky ran into Tom Hanks somewhere and Tom Hanks told him that he was driving along and uh, it was sort of pre-Oscar season and there was lots of radio reports about the Oscars and he heard a clip from extras with Kate Winslet saying, uh, you know, I'm doing this to win an Oscar, but he thought it was a recent interview <laughs> about the reader, and he was thinking, Kate, what are you doing? <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and, and so I think, you know, I think Ricky was at the Globes that year, and she won, and he made some acknowledgement of it. But it's just, you know, it's just those weird moments where suddenly you move from being this kind of fan and this outsider uh, to being kind of in the business, and suddenly these people are, uh, are other sort of workers in the same industry. And well, that's just it. Yeah. And that's the pretty spectacular part, when he takes off the Ziggy makeup. Right. And talks to you um, like a fellow worker. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing you also realize, I suppose, is that you don't, you can never get quite what you want. You, you want to be able to crawl inside their head and understand how they made that music and you know what I mean you want to yeah. sort of you want to you feel like somehow if you meet people that you admire you'll get some kind of access to their genius some insight and I think that you, comes you do through. to a degree maybe but you but you'll never you'll never know them in the way you want to. no but it does come through I think more for comedians 
because you get to hear their point of view. Last night, we, we mentioned earlier, we were at a, a birthday, and, and Albert Brooks, who's a hero of mine, of course, um, was there. And you get to know him better just by hearing him riff. Right. And sure. you get to be inside his head, as he was saying to me, and actually a, a friend, Jason Antoon, at some point we were breaking down um, a particular subject, and he went off on a tangent and suddenly realized we're watching Albert Brooks do stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thing I'm always intrigued by, and I don't know if this is, my, my test is always kind of how aware are they of sort of both their position in the kind of stratosphere, but also sort of just how aware are they of themselves. And that's always, the thing that's always disappointed me when I've met famous people is that, is that absence of self-awareness. That's the thing I always am looking for when I meet them. So you mean they, you want Tom Hanks to act like a giant movie star? No, I want Tom Hanks to know and acknowledge, isn't it weird that I'm Tom Hanks? And, <laughs> and he does, as far as I'm, the times I've met him, he's always been, not that he's going, this isn't it weird I'm Tom Hanks, but that he's, he's very kind of, He's grounded in the sense that he's aware that yeah. there's Tom Hanks, the movie actor, and then there's this other guy that makes movies and has a wife and family, and that that's yeah. the real him, and this other person is this other thing. And it's, there's this quote that we used in Extras once, uh, fame is a mask that eats into the face. And I think that's the, that's the celebrity people that, that are less appealing, the ones who've allowed celebrity and the fake them, the screen them, to kind of become... I found working with those, I have worked with a handful, giant movie stars who are not as comfortable acknowledging, isn't this weird? Right. But rather maintain the persona off camera. Yes. At rampant insecurity, I don't deserve any of this. Right. I must act the movie star so that everyone continues to think I am. Yeah. I'm yeah. nowhere near as interesting as everyone thinks I am. Right. Um, and I empathize and feel instantly sad when I see I don't mean empathize in the sense that I relate to it, because me too, but rather I see it, I acknowledge it, as opposed to, what's his fucking problem? Well, I think it's, I think it's, it's one of the reasons people are obsessed with celebrity, is because right. I think what they want to see is, they want to be able to judge, they want to be able to re reassure themselves that you can have money and fame, but it doesn't make you happy, and it doesn't make you a good person necessarily, and they want to hear stories of people being a shit. Mm -hmm. They want to hear stories of people having unhappiness, right. marriages falling apart. They want that reassurance that you, that you can, that, like you haven't won life just because you're successful. And, and I think that's one of the, these obsessions with celebrity and this, this kind of tabloid culture of sort of seeing people at their most raw and their most kind of... It's the Roman Coliseum. Right. But I don't think it's, it's not even that, it's not even judging them in the sense of you didn't entertain me. You, people can be super fans of these people and right. still excited and still enjoy their work, but they sort of don't, they, they want to know um, that you can be unhappy too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know oh, what I mean? Well, there you go. And it's the obsession recently with the Angelina Jolie thing. It's like people want to, they take a certain, there's this fascination with, oh, oh, well, she's had these difficulties and, and, and oh, and she's human and, I mean, that will only endear her to people, you know what I mean? Whereas before they could keep her at the arm's length if she's this fabulous movie star. Now it's, she's a real person with a body and a, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. it's fascinating kind of people's relationship to that. And it seems, we were talking earlier about John Cleese and that Basil Fawlty character. And, you know, he was a, a British archetype that aspired to wealth and to class climbing and to sort of a, a kind of being part of, of, of upper society. Right. And it seems like celebrity in a way has replaced that now and, and that sort of, you know, people aspire to, to be friends with or to enter the world of celebrity and show business. And that, um, that that's in some ways has replaced, certainly in England, I think it's replaced, um, you know, royalty or-, or Oh, for uh, sure. Uh, the upper, the upper- Well, here choice. where we don't have royalty, right. It could be our politicians, and right. it's not. It's the celebrity yeah. being yeah. famous for just being famous, right? Not for any particular talent or right or achievement. Yeah. Um, speaking of famous talent and achievement, it's now time for another game that we play on the show. I asked you prior to uh, going live that you uh, tweet your followers to let them know uh, to tune in, or or to tell them a word. So I like the fact that you're on the Twitter. We have a game that uh, our own Jamie Foxx, our head writer, created for the show called Who Tweeted? Celebrities have so much to say. Who Tweeted? Is the game we're gonna play. 
Sam Levine, please explain the game to our guests. With great pleasure. So the game is who tweeted. And the three tweeters are Tyra Banks, Paris Hilton, or Justin Bieber. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read a series of eight tweets, one at a time, and when you feel that you know who authored that tweet, you ring in by saying your own name, yep. and then I'll point to you, you'll have three seconds to either say Tyra, Paris, or Bieber. Sure. Ring in, you get it right, you get yourself five points. Ring in, you get it wrong, you lose Ooh, three. Yeah. There are penalties for being wrong. Once someone has uh, rang in and answered, they either get it right or wrong, we move on to the next question. All right. At the end of eight tweets, what happened, Sam? Whoever's in the lead Some sort of prize? is going to walk with this 20 U.S. dollar bill. Oh. Which is like nine. That's like six and a half pounds, six and a half as pounds. far as I'm some concerned. Sweet, sweet money right there. <laughs> that is, you're going to do a lot of damage. I can't even tell you how much Velveeta this will buy you. <laughs> sure you can. That, <laughs> 20 uh, loaves. 20 loaves of, that is how they sell it, by the loaf. Are you ready to play? I'm playing against You're Kevin. playing against yeah. Kevin. Oh, hell yes, right. you are. Okay. Good luck. Oh, yes. This is a heads-up match. God's Are you ready to play? Yes. Tweet number one. Just went and had a late-night snack at Fat Burger. They make the best fries and strawberry milkshakes. Kevin Paris. That is correct. Uh-oh. Off to an early lead. But He's played this, this before. This game has happened before. He is I feel that game. you can get inside Paris. <laughs> and who can? Uh, Good hey, night. Hey, there it is. <laughs> See take you later. A, take a number. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> well, one of the things that Jamie prides herself on, or I pride her on in putting the list together, is uh, taking tweets that, A, either all three of them might have uh, written, I see. typed, or clearly not the obvious choice. That was a toss-up. That was a toss-up. That could have been, been anyone. The could most fun I ever friend. had was one afternoon I was in a hotel room in Sydney. This could go anywhere, this story, couldn't it? <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and I just started retweeting uh, uh, Cindy Crawford tweets as myself. Joy. It was a joy. Wow. Just I don't know why. Just, as yourself, so you weren't I just retweeting. Said, I, I, I said, said to the listener, to the, to the tweet follower people, Twitter people. Readers. I, yeah, readers. I just said, uh, listen, I'm too lazy to write my own tweets. I'm just going to retweet. Um, Sydney Crawford tweets, and it was just, it was just stuff like, you know, um, uh, I think people, the reason people respond to me is I'm just, you know, the girl next door. You don't feel like I'm going to steal your husband away. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound like That's fun, like, actually. It's good. It's a good way to spend uh, an afternoon yeah. in Sydney. All right, Sammy. Tweet number two. All right. So you know when it's the weekend and you're lying in bed really long and it feels good, but your back starts hurting. But Steve. You don't. Lost the pen on that one. I think it's Bieber. Thank you, and I'm so sorry. It was Tyra Banks. Oh, what was the thank you for? Picking up the pen? He picked up my pen. All right. With his long arm. Because this little pterodactyl arm, that's not reaching all the way down there. I think Tyrannosaurus Rex is this guy. T pterodactyl also had this. Pterodactyl short... has a little tiny hand yeah, on the wing. Yeah, hand things. That's yeah, what yeah. I got. Yeah, right. He wouldn't reach a pen. Yeah, I couldn't. <laughs> I can't do anything. But it doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. What matters is tweet number three. Here we go. Riding, working, rolling, stressing, but still posing. Hashtag work Wednesday. That's the most obnoxious tweet I've ever Steve. heard in my life. I think, I mean, it feels like Bieber, but it could be Tyra. So you're going to go your with. It's got to be Bieber. It's Bieber. It's Tyra. It's Bieber. <laughs> it's Tyra. <laughs> it's Tyra. It's Tyra. Who is it? It's Tyra. Is that your final answer? Yes. It is Tyra! Yay! You brought her around! <laughs> All right. Under the pressure, you brought it around and came back. So getting, cl getting close. Five to two. Tweet number four. Just chilling with the fellas in Dubai. No big deal. Ha ha. I gotta go back to Kevin Paris. I started with Paris. I'm gonna go right back to her. Oh, sorry, no. We are tied. That was Bieber. That was Bieber. That was Bieber. Yeah. Tied up. Two all. It's anyone's game. Tweet number five. Getting exciting. Do you feel guilty when you crack open one egg and are greeted by two beautiful golden <laughs> yolks? Steve, I think that's Tyra. That's correct. There is a new leader on the board. That is correct, because sir. neither Bieber or Paris have ever cracked an egg open. <laughs> <laughs> well sus. See? See? That was well is, sus. This is the kind of gameplay I like. Yep. You're getting into their brains now. You Tweet. see? 
It's a fun game. Come it's on. It's a fun game. Tweet number right. six. Next time is you're in Sydney. Is it always these three people? Yes. Oh, it is? Next time you're in a Sydney hotel room, this is what you'll this be playing. Play, you yeah. can go online, actually, at the CapitalBolicChacha.com website and play the game yourself. Go ahead. Here we go. Just saw a pain gain movie. Such a good movie. Kevin Beaver. Oh, no! No! Thought we had a tie. That was Hilton. That was Hilton. Yeah. You were good at this yeah. game. This is, oh dear. This the lead is minus, expanded. Minus one to mm. plus seven. It's getting, you're gonna have to do. How many tweets, but two left? We got two left. Okay, I gotta get them both. You gotta get them in there. All right. Tweet number seven. Another beautiful day in LA. I love this city. Steve, it's Paris. I don't think you can win at this point, Kevin. That is absolutely no! correct. And with a score of a plus 12 to negative one, the eighth and final tweet really at this point is just showing off. I'm drawn dead. It's a quick one, I'll just say it. The eighth and final tweet, <laughs> God is great. Tyra, Kevin, Tyra. That could be any of them. <laughs> uh, let me finish on the positive. Kevin, Tyra. I'm afraid that Bieber. was Justin Bieber. Bieber. That is correct. Wow, master. And that is how you play and win. Who tweeted? Very well done. Well done. Sir. Right. Well Bears done. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game that we just played. Uh, you've done so much wonderful work. Now, as a writer, uh, we have a wonderful question from the Twitterverse, at Mahu Melon Ball. Have you ever had writer's block? And if so, what did you do to get past it? If there was one episode from one of the shows you wrote that you could rewrite, which one and why? Or that's three different questions. So the first one, writer's block, what do you do? Well, uh, I mean, writer's block, as I understand it, is a much more uh, sort of long-term problem where you're sort of confronted by the blank page and you just cannot get anything down, uh, right. which I've never suffered from. Uh, I mean, working in collaboration, there's normally, if you're struggling, there's normally someone who can kind of, you're pushing against. Come who, on. Who can kind of hopefully. Yeah. But I mean, there's many occasions where we found ourselves in a room just staring at each other, not quite sure. Normally, it's because something's not right somewhere else in the script mm. is always generally my what I've discovered, like, you know, you go back, you can you can kind of ignite it or take it down a different road. Um, uh, so I once got out of writing an essay at school by saying I had writer's block. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I, sort of, I got to that point kind of late in my high school years where, you know, because my grades were pretty good and I went to a pretty crappy school, I could pretty much get away with anything. <laughs> and so I would just say things like, yeah, I got writer's block. They would let me off for a while. It was preposterous. It was like I owned that school. It was crazy. Um, and uh, but yeah, I've never had real writer's block. In How about seeing things. an episode of one of the shows and thinking, "Man, we missed that horribly." Not even one. Well, I think it. I mean, there's, I feel like there's it's more little, like a there's, scene. There's little things I would change here and there, kind of always, really. You know, right. I mean, you just it's. But are you a never satisfied sort of? Or I am, but I'm also someone who kind of knows at some point you've just got to you've just got to say, well, that there it is now, you know, and yeah. and sort of move on from it. But uh, no, I, you know, I feel, I mean, it's even like you do, you know you do jobs of work and, and they, they're not always the audience doesn't always respond to them in the way you'd hoped. But you know, I figure like, well, we went into it with good intentions, so if you didn't like it, sorry, but yeah, there we are. Um, a uh, mutual co-star of ours now is Warwick Davis. Mm -hmm. um, what did you do with Warwick? How did I not? Bury the lead, buddy. I'm sorry. Bury the lead. Uh, Warwick is most famous for... Willow? Oh, you're in Willow? <laughs> Have you seen the movie? I've never seen the movie. Oh. No. Well, if you've never seen the we, movie, we... not only will this not mean anything to you, right. but to even me uh, suge suggesting how dare you. No, I, A, I was kidding. Uh, I am in the film, but I mean in terms of you, how dare you. Um, no, th there are the C-3PO and R2-D2 sort of characters that they tried to create for Willow as well. Okay, right. It's me and other comedian, Rick Overton, has mm -hmm. act as these little tiny brownies right. that are constantly yelling at him throughout the film. Oh, I see. This way! No, this way! But we're a little, very adorable. Um, <laughs> it sounds it. Like yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so, is this something where, I mean, my... 
peripheral observation seems to be that somewhere along the line, Ricky or both of you became a fan and ran into him and, and it sort of grew. Well, he was in extras and uh, we then, he came to us with this idea for a show about a little person, uh, which is until that we realized it had never really been done as a, as a sitcom. Right. And uh, he had so many funny stories and ideas and, you know, we just, we, I think initially we were just going to produce it and then somewhere on the line we ended up kind of writing it as well. And um, yeah, and he's, I mean, you know, he, I mean, he was young when you, when you worked with him in Willow, but really? you know, he's in his 40s now and he's just a really smart, yeah. he's a genuinely talented actor, which yeah. I think people often overlook when you, when you don't sort of fit the archetype. And, um, but also very funny, like really gets the jokes, great physical comedian, throws himself in, gung-ho. Uh, I, I, I have nothing but good things to say about him. I think he's, he's a knockout as a, as a performer, and yeah, I think he's great. Oh yeah, well, speaking of life as a performer, when extras finally does roll around and you officially go from behind the camera to in front of it and get to play a scene-stealing character who goes on to garner you awards, uh, British Comedy Award, I believe, at that very least. British Comedy Award, nominated for a Globe, I think. Lost out? No. Maybe a BAFTA? No, no, no. I think, I think we, the year that we were, we were nominated for extras uh, as a sitcom, and we, it was the year that it was, um, it was cancelled, I think. Let's hope. Uh, it was, I think, whether it was the writer's strike or something that year, but it was not screened oh, for some yeah. reason. Was the Globes there? It was the yeah the strike. And I was all sad. I thought this would be my moment. Ricky did the the funny speech last time. I'll have something this time. I yeah. got no, just just got it in the mail. <laughs> yeah, there was no ceremony. I think they gave out the awards in a in a hotel lobby somewhere in LA. <laughs> oh. Lovely. What a ter yeah. terrific. But anyway, yes, as a performer, then it was yes. So how? First of all, the genesis mm -hmm. of you're going to be on camera now, mm -hmm. to finding your. Um, gooey center and happy place in front of the camera. Right. Uh, having been a performer in front of live audiences, it's, it's uh, fairly organic in terms of transitions. Um, Ricky had no formal training. I'm going to foolishly assume the same goes for right. you. Um, how easy and comfortable are you instantly or otherwise? Well, I think the key thing from us was that we, you know, it's funny because I always felt like we'd performed together, he and I, sort of even on the radio, even though it was us being ourselves, there's, you know, you, you're still performing to a degree because you're trying to think of funny stuff. And and uh, and in the writing room, we'd always improvised on a lot of improv and we would take a dictaphone and record it and transcribe it. And, uh, you know, and so it felt like for both of us, I think that this was a resource yeah. that was here kind of just waiting to be used, really. Right. And I think I'd always thought of myself as a performer, and I was just, it was suddenly there was a moment where I just thought, I'm confused that people don't realize I am. And so once I did the show, it, it didn't seem, you know, I just felt very comfortable being sort of the comic character, and I didn't have to do any kind of dramatic acting, so I could just essentially be funny. Um, and I felt comfortable doing it, and... Uh, um, you know, and Ricky was very good at kind of being there and sort of, you know, observing it even in the scene and going, you're getting a bit crazy there or a bit broad, because my tendency is probably to be broader than I would like. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we just sort of settled into it and, and we were off and running really. And it was funny because, you know, you'd, you'd have people writing the reviews, you know, um, uh, oh, Steve Merchant, you know, a, a surprising turn from him. You know, I just thought, oh, well, you know, I mean... Been doing it for quite been a while. I've been doing it a long time, and yeah. I'd always performed at university and all these other things in sketch comedy and stuff. So, But also the radio stuff really was, right. uh, and podcast was at such a degree. And even with stand-up, you know, it's the thing about stand-up is making it look like you're just saying it. Right. When in actual fact, you know, you've said it a hundred times before. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so uh, that was it. But I think I'd always felt like I could perform and that that would be enjoyable, and that was the thing I discovered. It's just fun. Yeah, you know, it's it's. I mean, really, when I hear actors complaining, it annoys me. Yeah, and the other thing that annoys me is when an actor says, um, "You know, the thing is, I'm so moved because um, if I wasn't acting, there's nothing else I could do." No, there is other things you could do. You just don't want to do them, um, and you don't want to train for them. You could be a doctor, but you're not going to do seven years of medical because you'd rather do this because this is easier and you get paid more. Yeah, you know that's the truth of it. I mean, it's great, and there's some brilliant actors who do amazing work. But let's not lose sight of the fact <laughs> that it's not you're not fighting in Iraq. I'm not even you're sure. You're not it's a noble. nurse in the uh, yeah. in the uh, you know the uh, the hospital room on a on a Friday night where a guy comes in with a screwdriver in his head. You know what I mean? You're you're just you might be pretending to be a doctor. 
in that situation, <laughs> right. but you're not the real thing. And My favorite thing with, uh, with that is uh, it usually takes only till day two of a job where you're sitting in the makeup chair and the, and the actor next to you is complaining about being brought in too early the day before. Right. Yeah. And weeks before that, when they were unemployed, right. the rampant of course. fear and of course. anxiety. The met. speed with which you acclimatize. We talked about limousines. I remember when we first arrived, we got in that limousine to the Globes. I couldn't believe it. We're in a limousine. A subsequent event we went to, they sent a limousine. I remember, th I remember thinking, well, this is not as nice as the other one. <laughs> Straight away. Straight away. Now, I, now, I'm, now I'm a critic of limousines. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just it's what amazing. What is it, that? I think it, we've always said this. I think it's that you acclimatize to whatever situation you're in. Good or bad. And then you basically kind of you revert to whatever your your natural state of sort of being is. So like I remember even when we did The Office, I remember we used to say, I'm sure if you went to NASA, I'm sure if you're in the mob, you still have the same sort of petty annoyances. You know what I mean? Someone at NASA is still annoyed that you've borrowed their chair. They right. had it just the right height. You've borrowed it. You didn't return it. Yeah. You borrowed their stapler. Right. Where is it? I need the stapler because I got some important information about the shuttle <laughs> to staple together, you know, or, or a list of people we have to bump off. You know, where's the witness protection list? I'm going to staple it. You've stolen it. Um, you right. know, it's like I think you just wherever you are, you just there's you just you know somebody's just, whinging. Right. And so, you know, it's easy. You, it's very hard to remember when you are um, making a film the time when you weren't making a film. Yeah. So the things that bother you that day, they bother you because they do bother you. Of course they do. Right. It's hard. You can't constantly keep going. I'm so um, lucky. I'm, I'm so, so lucky. lucky. I'm so lucky. Sometimes you've just got to go, I am, it is cold and yeah. I am, it is four in the morning and I am tired. Right. That's human. It took me, I think, quite a while to be comfortable enough in a professional environment to actually speak my opinion about how horrible things were in that particular setting, right. four in the morning or, uh, or whatever it was. And, and not feeling like, A, um, you don't want to rock the boat under any circumstances. Right. So then you get these wonderfully successful performers, actors, actresses, what have you, filmmakers, who develop these extraordinary abilities to be a royal pain in the ass, completely disconnected right. to anyone else's needs or functions. Yes. How do you guys or you professionally a factor that in in a in a workplace. Like I I've gone to great lengths on this show and every opportunity to say what an absolute nightmare Rip Torn was to work with. <laughs> right, right. And now granted he ultimately ended up trying to hold up a bank at five in the morning in his pajamas. It was right. covered in all the news, so I'm not uh, calling anything out of school now. Sure. Um, so without naming names, it's unnecessary. What did, do you have a? Is it uh, an, generally my experience has been. Uh, very good. And I'm not just saying this politically. I, I think maybe because of the, most of the things we've done with, with famous people have been very brief sure. windows of time. So if you're working with someone for one or two days, it, it, there's not much time for them to, to sort of not be on their best behavior because th the speed with which you're working means that they're, they're, they're acting mm. for most of that. And, and generally actors are kind of happy when they're acting. It's, it's, a sort of, it's the other things that seem to uh, annoy them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the waiting to act. It's the you know. Sure. It, it's all the other stuff which which allows the kind of ego to sort of fester. But yeah. but when you just start doing the scene and you're laughing and they're feeling reassured that they're being funny, generally then I've never I've never encountered problems. Occasionally there's people with, again it tends to be people sort of lower down the chain who have the egos because they are as you say they're perhaps less secure uh, with their status. Right. Um, and they can be a bit more. Trouble. Well, Carl seems to be without ego, and yet, right. as Ricky would yell at the top of his voice, there's been no greater whinger right. that ever lived. Right. Uh, i got to stop saying that. It's become like a zealot thing where I just think it's okay for me to use a word that I only learned because of you guys. Um, uh, but I do love words like that. Uh, so let's get to a point with him where part of your guys chemistry that it becomes world renowned, the right. three of you, is um, you guys having a laugh at um, his uh, lack of genius. So when, when are those moments, not just in testing him with Idiot Abroad, is there ever a moment where you feel we're being a bit hard on the boy or... It's just part and parcel of the relationships. Uh, there was one 
there was an instance in an episode of Video Abroad where he is, we'd manufactured that he was going to be kidnapped. <laughs> he was in Israel and he was going to be kidnapped and thrown in the back of a truck and driven and it was part of kind of um, sort of anti-terrorist training. So he knows. Which is something that they do. Sure. Uh, but we hadn't told him that was going to happen. Sorry, it sounded like you said you hadn't told him. That's right. We hadn't told him that, that masked men were going to appear and throw him in the back of a truck. And uh, we Any time during the discussions of the, in the planning, someone says, what if there's a sharp object nearby and he tries to protect himself? Uh, I think our assumption was that's someone else's problem, isn't it? <laughs> Is that our concern? We're not, as long as we're not going to get sued... Is that all right? No, of course it was. It was all like any kind of prank. It was all worked to make sure that that um, there were no sharp There was no sharp eyes. But also that you know the thing about Carl is he's he's a very unique being because you know you see that side of him which is him at his most idiotic. Um, but he's also like weirdly. I've never met anyone like him because for all of his kind of idiocy, there is also a smartness to him. That's, sure that's w w odd, and it, that the two sides don't seem to... Well, it seems like in his own... It's very bizarre. In his own area of, of, of life and, and personal awareness... Right. He thinks he's got it all figured out. Right. So there's a certain amount of intelligence that he's comfortable with. Right. And it be has become well, a Well, he's a lack of, of pretension, for instance. Utter. Which, you know, most people you meet don't have, but he does not care... really doesn't care what you think of him. He couldn't give a fuck. And he couldn't care less. And that's not a way to protect himself. No, he just, he just, and it's a very, it's weird because I think there's, there's people from Manchester, and he's from Manchester. Uh, there's a certain sort of strain of people from Manchester that have that sort of, are, are very self-assured, mm. are often very witty, and there's for all of the things that we, that Carl has said unwittingly, uh, that are funny. He's also said things which intended to be funny and were funny because he has got a kind of working class wit. You know what I mean? That, and it's a weird mm. mashup, and you're never quite sure which one you're in. Right. So with the with the kidnap, you know, we were fairly sure he would twig quickly what was going on, and that this was all part of the show, which is indeed what happened. But there was a moment when we were looking at the footage, we were wondering, has this just stepped too far? Like, will people just think well, now you're... this is too cruel? But then <laughs> he was just too funny in that moment, you know. And you see this footage where they're explaining to him, you know, that he's got to have a safe word. And I can't what the safe word is. It's some. It's it's Congress tart, which is like a weird kind of confectionery, you know, from the north of England. And they say, "What's your what's your security word? Uh, what's your safety word?" And he's going, "Congress tart, Congress tart," with like a bag over his head. Um, and you're like, "There's no way this is not going on TV." Um, so there are occasions where we were worried about his. Um, his sort of well-being in that regard. But of course we would never put him in real danger and we would no. never... And he's always got the option to say no in the end. Right. We um, um, would never put him in real danger. I just flash at the moment when he's strapped to the top of a bi-wing airplane. Right. As it's doing loops and he's just screaming about... <laughs> that was funny as well, you're right. I remember. Yeah. Screaming that about how funny. much he hates it. But you remember, it. He, he, he made that choice because he, we'd asked, he, he's either go on the bi-wing or go to International Mr. Leather, uh, the International Mr. Leather contest. Right. And he went there, he took one look, he left, and he went on the wing. So, <laughs> right. So, you know, you gave he had him the a option. choice. He had a choice. Yeah. He could have walked away. And rejected premises, dare I ask? I always wanted to do a show called Fool's Gold that was him, we give him a million pounds, and he has to, uh, to double that money. I mean, because I just the investments, like to see what he would invest. I can't remember. We came up with like the rules of sort of whether he. I, don't, I think he could gamble a portion of it, and his plan was he would say, "Oh, I'll just I'd go to Poland and Eastern Europe, and I'd and I'd buy a load of property, and then I'd do it out and sell it on." Like that was his plan, because <laughs> the Eastern European property market is so alive. That's what everyone's talking about. It, you know, that's where you make your money. Then would he have just a, obviously a window of opportunity, like you have one he'd have year? Like a year he'd have a year, and I think he. Well, the idea was he has to spend every pound once, so he can't just put it in a like savings like account. A million yeah, he has to that. spend the money. Yeah. Uh, that was an idea I thought would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, tremendous fun. Um, all right, let's, I want to make sure that all of these... Nope, got one for you. Uh, oh, good. This is uh, a very nicely uh, designed Tweet 5 for you. T5! T5! 
At I am von Stroheim. Number one, monkey news or rockbusters? News. Slough or Scranton? Slough can't be the correct pronunciation. I'm fucked Slough up. Slough is right, yeah. Oh, it is. Or Scranton. I'll take Slough. Bow ties or bowling shoes? Bow ties, classy. XFM or podcast? I think we asked that one before. It was pod. Andy Millman or Greg Lindley Jones? Uh, wow, these are these are nerdy questions, mm -hmm. aren't they? Uh, uh, oh, Millman. You got four out of five. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so when can we look forward to Hello, Ladies? You're about to start production on this. Right. Yes, this will be on air, I think, uh, hopefully at the end of September. Right. Here in the U.S. I don't know where it will be so shown elsewhere. It's made for HBO. Right. Um, how was your process thus far from... Um, you said when you started doing the tour in 2011, it really wasn't a concept that you right. even thought about for it being a television show. So wh whose idea was it? I think it was my agent who said, you know, uh, who brought some HBO people along to the stand-up show and, and said, you know, maybe this could be a sitcom. And, and that's how it evolved, really. And they said, we don't hate the idea. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and then we, I wrote the script with these guys and, and we presented it to them and they seemed to go for it. We made a pilot and did the whole thing. Um, you know, I, I, much as I love American... Uh, Sitcoms, you know, the, my anxiety was always, you know, the horror stories you hear about the kind of development process. And, mm. you know, in the BBC that we've worked with in England, they've always been very kind of pretty hands off and very supportive. Uh, here, you know, I've only ever heard horror stories about the kind of the machine and, you know, a thousand sort of anonymous suited executives all chipping in. And, like, you know, and you want to say, who, who are you again? Yeah. What and have they you have done? The one at the top has that genius ability to find the center of why it's great and then right. add water directly to that Right, point. right. But, but my experience with HBO in the past, and certainly this so far, has been that that doesn't happen and that they are much more um, you know, akin to the BBC in that way. They have thoughts, but you know, they, they trust you to, to make the show, which is, which is great. I mean, otherwise, you know, I don't think I could cope. Not because I'm, sort of, I'm not collaborative. I just I have a real problem with, with just arbitrary people. T I, t I hate it when there's, when there's an agenda that's anything other than what's the best thing for this show. Mm. If there's an agenda that's, um, we, 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 we did a test and we found out that people in Ohio like the color blue. So can the characters be wearing more blue? Right. Uh, yeah, that, I just, I don't care. You know what I mean? You, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it, it's that stuff that, 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 I, that I struggle with. If you have a genuine good idea, great. That's perfect. Let's put it in the mix, you know. Right. Um, but uh, so far it's been good. You'll do, 12, 13? Uh, eight for eight? this season, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're in the process of uh, writing and you start shooting... A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. And you'll be involved, uh, obviously, as a showrunner, but will you be directing as well? I'll be or? directing a bunch and uh, I'm in it and I'm, yeah, I'm all over it. It's just, yeah, it's, a, it's just... It seems like maybe everything you've done thus far is sort of leading up to yet another version of an opportunity right. that uh, gets to pull on all the strengths that you've Right, and this is the thing, developed. because this is, here I'm playing a nerdy guy uh, who can't score with women. Which is... And if I can't pull this off, then I, it's not like I got other avenues of my performing <laughs> talents that I can explore, you know what I mean? Like, this is... This is it now. Uh, <laughs> it's not like I'm going to go off and play, you know, like a Russian mobster. You know. <laughs> um, I've got to find this one because you just touched upon, oh, here it is. You just touched upon um, something that came up through the research. Yahoo uh, Movies has, you know, a bio of sorts. In studying your dossier, I have to ask, does your current or possibly former flatmate, Dan Warren, mind being referred in your Yahoo uh, movies bio as your companion? What? Yeah. There is a bio what online. What are you talking about? Well, first of all, there's a name Dan Warren ring a bell. Yeah, he's my former flatmate. Yeah. Former yeah. flatmate. Okay. Well, that's what I assume, that he was just a roommate, we would call yes. here, flatmate there. In the Yahoo movie bio. And what is the Yahoo it's movie bio? It's similar to IMDb. Right, okay. The Someone Yahoo, has written this. Yahoo.com prides itself on collecting information about famous people. And any page that if you Yahoo search someone famous, right. a bio will come up. Right. Um, clearly not written by you. Right. And it lists, you know, My your companion. father, name, 
mother, name, sister, name. Yes. But at the top, companion, where you would see wife. Yes. That's what the word companion mostly means in this country. Yes. Dan Warren. So I'm curious, obviously you didn't know about it. Right. So I'm interested to know what Dan Warren's actual wife <laughs> and child will think about this. Um, I think yeah. it's fantastic. No, listen, I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not embarrassed by it. I'm just surprised because it's not like, well, firstly, it's not like anyone knows him. Or checked with or, you. Or checked with me, but also like to make the leap that, well, they live together. <laughs> Oh, they li they did live together. I mean, we haven't lived together for yeah. You know, is this the five. '40s where this sort of assumption might have been made? Right, but also um, just just but just that assumption of kind of you've cobbled that together from sort of bits of information and just well, he must be companion. We'll just assume. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'll assume for no real information. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's amazing. The there's a sort of there's, have you noticed this? That and I've seen this as well. I'll do a, an interview for a very legitimate news publication, and. And I will give them an hour, two hours of time, and we'll sit and we'll talk, and they'll ask me questions. And then I will read the article, and there will be some piece of information like this, which they just lifted, the journalist has just lifted from the internet. Right. And you just think, but what was the point of sitting with me? Yeah. You could have checked this information. Now you're telling me, I remember um, I did an interview, and it was that you know, I was going to be in a movie version of Bride's Head Revisited. Because again, some were online had written that somewhere. Yeah. Or that I saw that in the, in the right. Or yeah. that Mariah Carey was going to do extras. No. Someone had written a joke blog uh, as though it was Ricky. Right. And uh, pretended Mariah was going to be in the show. Just. But now that's just regurgitated as fact. Yeah. And there's a point at which it's sort of you know it just it's just because it's written down in what looks like something quite official. Yeah. Then it becomes the truth. That's the extraordinary thing, and it's been going on for a while. We were talking about last night, actually, about um, Jaden is Will Smith's son's name. Mm -hmm. uh, the story broke. The news broke that he uh, uh, wants to be emancipated from his parents. Right. Right. So it turns out uh, Will made a joke. Everything's right. going so great for my son, it's just a matter of time before he demands being emancipated. Sure. It's then shared in, in every uh, online news organization, and I'm sure it made the broadcast as well, that the son was, in fact, uh, uh, making plans to right. become emancipated. And then finally, someone had the wherewithal to put a microphone in front of Jaden and say, probably at some premiere, what, what is your response to this news story that, uh, you, you know, what, what are your plans once you've become yeah, emancipated? Yeah. And he said, everything is, all the shit is free in my dad's house. Why would I, I'm going to stay right. there until I'm yeah, 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, was a completely. joke my dad made in an interview. Right. I'm not leaving. Are you kidding? This well, is you, the it's cushiest. Funny because you end up policing yourself. Yeah. And people say, you know, journalists will say, you know, well, they were closed off and they didn't. But it's because you say something as a joke. Irony, you, put, you say anything ironic in a news interview. Oh. And that is re recycled as fact. Yeah. I mean, I've had I've seen Ricky get criticised for jokes he's made right. in his stand-up show, right. as though he'd said that sort of in person to some. You know what I mean? Like, with, but he's a comedian. Yeah. You can't take a person's com comedy act. Right. And, 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 and then, or it's like you may as well take something a line you said in a movie. Right. Right. And and, and accuse you of having the same opinion. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. just. It's weird. It's, it's well, it, the the, the um, it makes an argument for freedom of the press. Well, there's always that great quote of you know, <laughs> there's 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 everyone has the freedom to sort of to shout fire in a crowded theatre as a joke, but but you just don't. Right. You know what I mean? But you it's just like, don't. You just don't. Like, the, yeah. the, 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 the freedom the, of press comes responsibility, and I think that's the press could have shouted to everyone with ears that uh, Kennedy was uh, not the first president to get laid in the White House right. with someone other than his wife. Right, right. But right. they just didn't. They just didn't, yeah. Um, yeah. Sammy, you had one follow-up question I wanted to allow. Be as our guest starts to contemplate uh, his version of the Larry King game, I will go over the rules again mm -hmm. as, um, as we start to wind things up. But I know before we started, Sammy, you said you had something you wanted very desperately to ask our guest. Could you... Uh, are you stroking out? <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to chat with our guests. <laughs> no, I thought you said you said. Um... I didn't. I didn't have any of that. I will just throw this in there. I'm I... sorry. That was me throwing Sammy under the bus. But which, which, by the way, in the Star Trek movie, which I loved magically, takes place in the year 2249 or something like that. 2259, somewhere in that 
area. Sure. Uh, Captain Kirk says something about Spock, saying, I can't believe you threw me under threw the bus. Threw me under the bus. <laughs> In 2249. Yeah. <laughs> well, we still say let the cat out of the bag. Uh-huh. Which started in the 40s? Oh, uh, hundreds of years ago. Not hundreds. Hun two, two, three hundred years ago. Really? Absolutely. You know the origin of this? Yeah, it's, they would sell pigs, piglets, uh, to farmers in a big sack. And uh, it, pigs were expensive. And so they'd pull the old switcheroo, they'd fill a sack full of kittens sure. instead, show them the pigs, and then switch the sack out and hand them the cats. And if the cats would escape, you'd let the cat out of the bag. Wow. That is... Or so the legend goes. Sure. Yeah, that's so we still say that. I was beginning to wonder if the eight hours I've been here was going to sort of, you know, was going to be any kind of takeaway. But and there you have <laughs> there it. There it is, right there. Culminate in any sort of information. Yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, that's what I was coming to you for. Earning that paycheck. <laughs> um, I would love to have got Carl's analysis of where he thought that originated. <laughs> that would have been incredible. Oh, yeah. It's interesting about Carl is that he doesn't have, he, we used to try and explain to him, you know, there'll be phrases like, um, people in glass houses shouldn't right. throw rocks. But his take would always be like, who lives in a glass house? Yeah, why would <laughs> you? What do you mean? You know, why? He, like, he doesn't understand sort of why poetry or the kind of a neatness of a saying. You know, we have one in England, I don't know if you use it here, a stitch in time saves nine. I remember you bringing right. this up on the podcast with him. Yeah, and a stitch in time saves nine. You know, you, you act today and uh, on a tear in your shirt and it'll save the nine stitches you'll have to do That's down right. the road when it gets bigger. And it's like, well, why wouldn't you just say, mend your shirt today? <laughs> well, I know, but it's a, it's a free. Yeah, but it's a, it, I don't know what it means. You know what I mean? And, it's, and there's a sort of legitimacy to that. Like, why? you know when someone says, I don't, I, I don't see the point of poetry? You can argue with that. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't like art. Yeah. All right. I mean, I can't justify why a painting's beautiful if you either like it or you don't. It's not enough to say you're an idiot, no. Right, <laughs> right. Um, I can't thank you enough, honestly. Thank for spending you for the eight me. hours with us and going away with so very little. 20 bucks? Yeah. Well, there's the 20 and then the uh, cat out of the bag. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and there's a gift bag. It's got a copy of your book. You can't put a price tag on I that. I did sign and a copy have a cat or a pig in it. of my book to you, and there is not a cat or a pig in it. <laughs> Quick. Get a, get a pig. <laughs> Not and or a cat. Um, okay, so let me uh, reiterate the rules of the Larry yes. King game. That'll be your camera that you will stare down the barrel of to uh, reenact right. a moment on his show. Larry King is the journalist broadcaster. Uh, guy. Uh, journalist is a loose word. Uh, wildly loose. Right. As loose as the word with could the ever red be. Yeah, with the. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and he thought it was okay to share something about himself before going to the phones. Um, and it could be um, uh, never uh, try to enjoy an Oreo cookie without a glass of milk. Something that meaningless, mm -hmm. uh, more than meaningless, something everyone had thought of and, and, and it's so pedestrian. But also would share something, I was five and uh, my friends and I stole the truck. You know, right. just, just ridiculous. Right. So the game, and then he would go to the phone. So the game is Badler King Impression. Don't want a good one. Right. So you're not as familiar with his voice, this will be easy. Mm -hmm. And then anything about not just Larry, but it could be mankind in general. Right. Um, in, the, in the guise of Larry's musings. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the phones that the name of the city is funny sounding. It's helpful. Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, it would be Schenectady, hello, because you're actually <laughs> tuning into a caller. I see. Uh, so there's your uh, uh, camera. Okay. Feel free to. Jeez. Okay. Right. Um, uh, <laughs> I remember when Joan Rivers and I went to see Lincoln, not the film, the man. <laughs> Hogwater. Hello. <laughs> that is exactly how you play the Larry That's King game. Genius. Okay. That sounded more like Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> There's no bad version, they're all funny. Okay. Um, brilliant. That's all right, it was. that's the end? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's where we ended each time. Sure. Uh, a, a British origin or otherwise, I just say brilliant, and we move on to the next. <laughs> um, thank you again, honestly and truly. Thank yeah, you for Just me. A, a, a forever long fan, and tickled beyond belief that we should meet at a particular movie night, and then um, uh, instantly. And I meant what I said that night, by the way. If there's anything I can do to make sure. Uh, does stay any more enjoyable. Yeah, that would be great. Thank uh, you. Crazy to help in any way, shape, or form. We've just entertained uh, some family seemingly nonstop for the last five weeks, so uh, 
happy to, to offer in any way. Uh, okay, sit there uncomfortably for the next uh, 90 seconds while I wrap things up for the folks at home. Stephen Merchant, we want to thank our guests so very, very much. Sammy, Jamie, um, off to uh, a tremendous party that we'll talk about next show. How about sure. that? Sure, why not? Kenny, Dr. Chen, Evil Dr. Chen, all good. Thank oh, you again okay. so very much. Elaine Ewing, our social media maven, has once again done a terrific job. Angie Johnson, uh, may or may not be your last name, uh, who uh, was a witness to a car accident before uh, showing up uh, slightly tardy here, but managed to uh, dust the four of us so wonderfully. Uh, Justin, J-Mac, and Josh handling the uh, launching of the shuttle, as it were, and of course, the intern who works harder than all of us put together, David, who has done... Uh, and he didn't do something he was supposed to do today, and I broke a nail. David Mandel was not... Uh, <laughs> present for the busting of the nail as you tried to lift the cover off the wonderful sandwiches. <laughs> that's a lot. Of, that was hard work. Yeah, um, I think that's it. Tune in. Uh, we're going to take uh, next Sunday off, the 26th. Uh, I'm off to the south of France for the Cannes International Film Festival. Careful! I heard there was gunfire. Yeah, uh, fake false, gunfire. fake. Yeah, nonetheless. Still, um, it. Always fun. Yeah, because nothing ever goes wrong in the south of France. Yeah. It's, it's not riddled with criminals this time of year. Uh, Rob Delaney, followed by Michael C. Hall, followed by others and, and better, and watch for more. Yeah. Write to us at contact at That's it. Until next time, and as always, get out of my face. <laughs>